They always happen. When did this happen? Oh, there we go. They're just sticky. Too much simple green. <laughs> I know. Extra pen. Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'd like to call this January 22nd, 2019 meeting of the Whitefish City Council to order. Sorry, we're running just a few minutes late. We had a rather lengthy discussion at our work session prior to the regular meeting. It is our finance director and assistant city manager's birthday tonight, so I'd like to wish Dana a happy birthday and ask her to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dana. Uh, we will move on to communications from the public, and this is time set aside for individuals from the audience to comment on items that are on the agenda but not advertised for a public hearing. So we do have several public hearings of this evening. We have five, so I would ask that you wait to comment on those specific hearings until those are called. But if there's anything you wish to bring to the attention of the council now, this would be your opportunity. Name and address for the record, please. My name is Molly Higgins Bruce. I, Bruce. I live at 116 Shady River Court in Whitefish, and I would like to cover, uh, talk very briefly about the Riverbank subdivision. Is this the appropriate time? It is not. That is advertised for a public hearing. Actually, excuse no. me, the public hearing was closed, so now would be your opportunity. Okay, Sorry. thank you. I understand the need for the community to develop more rental properties. I work with people at the hospital who need rentals. However, I think that this particular subdivision is, has too many rental units. It is too dense. It is unlike anything that presently is in Whitefish. I think the traffic will be miserable for reasons that were talked about at um, the planning and boarding, planning, anyway. <laughs> um, uh, Briefly, another thing that I would really like to see you emphasize, there are beautiful standing trees on both the west and the eastern side of the property, and I would like to see all of them mandated to be maintained. Um, I know that some developments, the trees have all been raised, and um, these are big pine trees that will protect the area and protect the river. The last thing I'd like to talk about is that the riverbank needs better protection in the development. I live directly across from this development. I used to wade the river to go to the old hospital where I worked in the day, and I had to climb the street steep bank, and it's muddy, and I know about it. And it differs at different river levels, um, but the vision of <clears throat> up to 500 people living there, enjoying that river, and all of their dogs, and the impact that that is going to have on the bank. I know that Bruce Booty, um, bless his heart, had talked about little trail systems in there. I think it should be planted thickly with um, willows and thorn apples, and that the area should be protected. And I thank you very much. Thanks for your comments tonight. Who's next? Aaron. Oh, go ahead, sir. 
My name is <clears throat> my name is Bob Dye, and I live at 308 Shady River Lane, also across from the development. The uh, number of units that you're putting in here are 234, some of them two bedroom. They're going to attract a lot of cars, maybe up to 400 cars, who knows, or more. The number of parking spaces that they're proposing and asking for an exception, I don't even think are going to meet the needs of the people who live le there, let alone having any parking spaces for visitors to come. So that's going to create a problem. The worst problem that I see is the traffic. Uh, if any of you or anybody in the audience have the misfortune of uh, driving in that area from 10th to Columbia to the high school and the grade school and the junior high, it's bumper to bumper all the way from 93 all the way back when the buses are there to 7th or beyond. Nobody thought of changing a traffic pattern. For example, putting in a light at 7th Street and 93 and having everybody from the schools maybe go that direction. No, now you have everybody channeled right to where the apartments are going to come. You've got a new street coming in to extend Columbia that are going to turn on a, I heard a two-way stop sign, not a three-way. That's going to be a, a fun. If you try to get out of Walgreens right now when school's out, you're going to be sitting there a long time because all the parents want to hurry up and get home and nobody wants to let you through. Now you've got the people at the animal hospital trying to do the same thing and the people in the apartment. Since I went to the uh, planning meeting a couple months ago, every time I drive on 93, I look at 15th Avenue. And I try to picture people zipping across, making a left turn on 93, since you can't put another traffic light there. I think that's going to create a nightmare. So they have a choice of making a left-hand turn there or trying to get onto 10th Avenue to get to 93. I would like to see you put in less units instead of seven. Why can't they do five? Then you've got room for parking and you've cut down the number of people that are driving out there. And the last thing is think in terms of what kind of entry do you want to the city of Whitefish? Right now we live in a highly desirable city. People love to live here. You make it look like Los Angeles with traffic jams. No one's going to want to be here. We're going to want signs along 10th Avenue and Columbia with all your pictures on it. This traffic jam brought to you by John, Ryan, Andy, Richard, Melissa, and Katie. Frank. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate your comments. I'm Terry Peterson from Columbia Avenue in Whitefish. I have prepared a list of 21 questions. I noticed on the rules and regulations and etiquette of the city council that you should restrict how many minutes each of us has to make a presentation. I'm not going to read all of these, just point out a few of them. I've made a copy for all of you. I'm concerned about traffic. I'm concerned about the density. It was interesting. I went back and read minutes from previous presentations of projects to the city council. And there's a project at River Bend where they wanted to consolidate three buildings into one with a density of 24 units per building. And the comments from the people who lived in that area were, we don't have anything this dense in this area. We don't understand why we are packing so many people into a building. So I have a, a little editorial on that. I don't want us to, I don't want to see Whitefish wind up with a project like some of the urban areas have. The other thing, the other question I have for the city council, and you can review these at your leisure, is um, I have not heard anyone address 
the issue of disability access and handicap parking in the parking spaces that have been designated because they are going to give up 100 of them for the sake of community benefit. And if we are going to have housing for uh, economically challenged workforce, they're not all going to be on, they're not all going to be bipeds. Some of them will be disabled either by accidents or strokes or whatever. I haven't heard that addressed in the plans, although we may not be privileged to see all the plans, but I think it's something that the city council ought to look at. Additionally, when I looked again at the location of the buildings, and my question was, where is the economically um, reserved apartments located in those buildings? Are they equally distributed across the seven buildings? Are they all in the basement? Or are they equally distributed on all floors? Because that sends a message that we will make housing available, but <clears throat> at diminished terms. And I don't know that that is the philosophy of this community. Also, are all of the f apartments equipped with laundry facilities? Are they individual or are they all located in a central area within the apartment buildings? And are those handicap access? I'd like to get a better definition of how many handicap parking spaces will be allocated for handicap dwellers in all seven buildings. Also a question I had when I read the um, staff report on this uh, Riverview, Riverbank enterprise <clears throat> was how tall are all of these buildings going to be? Across the city of Whitefish in uh, the area, there's a limit of 35 feet. I don't know. I haven't seen a ledger indicating how tall the buildings are, but it is going to make a difference in keeping with the community image. And one of the things that has been um, mentioned in the project is that this project will consider with an architectural review the the uh, distinct character of the community, the ambiance, the mass, the density, and the height of the buildings. How many floors are in the buildings? One of the things I thought was a, a little bit of a disservice on this particular report was the pictures and the diagrams are not clear. They're poorly marked. They're um, I would like to see, since most architectural projects of this magnitude usually have for display and public viewing a 3D model. And I haven't seen one unless it's sequestered someplace in City Hall. But it would be nice for the residents of, and all the homeowners and renters, for us to see exactly what this looks like. The pictures are a little bit, um, it's kind of, uh, you guess where they might wind up. Um, there were comments that, um, there's a question about who has the right of way on 15th, and the city doesn't have it, and the city doesn't have any funds to do anything about that. So is that going to be the responsibility of the project holders of Riverbank? Also, if that right-of-way goes through to make this connection into the rear of this apartment complex, who's going to bear the expense of that if the city can't afford it? Also, I asked at one of the original um, presentations before the city council, 
what we were going to do with the proposed water shortage and sewer problem that we already are facing in the city of Whitefish. And there is the suggestion that the water rates again will go up to meet the existing need right now. And if we have 234 units with approximately, and I know you question my decimals, 2.2 people in them, um, what is going to be the load on the existing water and sewer system in the city of Whitefish? How is that going to affect the people, the landowners? Is the rent on all of the units, including the economically challenged? Will that include all of the utilities? And will some of that cost of the extra things for water, sewer, right-of-ways, roads, where is that going to be picked up? There was a mention in this report, the staff report, that the project people were seeking a tax inc increment from the city. And I, there wasn't an explanation of that, so I don't know what that means. But I'd like to see the city council address that for those of us who do not spend our professional life in planning or zoning. Also, the project developers are advocating that they will continue with the WB2 zoning regulation. And my question, and many of my neighbors' question is, why are we not looking at WR4, which specifically states efficiencies, duplex, triplex, fourplex, and anything bigger than that. I do not see in the existing uh, neighborhood right now that they're referring to as WB of any um, residential that would meet the density of what is being proposed before our city council. I will make a copy of this available to all of the city council members. And I think we still need some answers because there's a lot of things pending out there that I don't know anyone who's supposed to give approval have approved it, including the Montana Department of Transportation about the right-of-ways, about the grids, about the traffic pattern. And so I think it's only fair that we ask for more input and I would love to see a model. I think that because we have architects in our family, most architect students are really good at producing 3D models. We always used to say in the science department that they were the people who got to bring toys to work and because they were always carrying around a model around campus. And I think it would behoove whoever is on either side of the fence with this project, if we could see visually how these um, buildings are positioned, to look at this leaves much to your imagination about what those buildings look like. I am concerned with us having a building project that will wind up looking like a Chicago project. Thank you. Do you want these now or later? Thanks, Terry. You can hand them to me, please. Okay. I'll hand them to our city clerk. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Just want to remind folks, we have a pretty lengthy agenda tonight. We have five public hearings scheduled, so just please take that into consideration when you um, approach the council tonight, please. I'll be quick. My name is Larry Bruce. I live at 116 Shady River Court. And um, I pretty much concur with what you already heard, so I'm not going to get too in depth with that. Um, I do think that it is pretty high density in this particular area when you consider the number of automobiles that are going to be in there, you know, anywhere from three to 400 cars and stuff. And I'd like to see that kind of downscaled a little bit. I, 
totally in affordable housing. I think everybody should have the right to live in this beautiful community and make it work for her. And I think Bruce Broody's done a great job with um, architectural landscape design and stuff. But it, to me, it seems like it makes sense if we could kind of disperse things a little bit, find other properties that can be developed and kind of spread it out a little bit. And that's pretty much it. That's all I got to say. One other thing I'd like to add real quick is I went to the recycle bin over by the train depot and the container that takes the cans and the plastic. You know, I went there and it's like, oh my goodness, you know, the thing is completely packed full. People are leaving bags of stuff next to it. And I think it would be nice if that thing could get, potentially get emptied more often or maybe put another container in there. That's all. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. Karin. Hi, I'm Karin Hilding, and the address, our address is 1016 Creekview Drive. And um, I'm speaking tonight as a resident rather than as a city employee. Um, and uh, I wanted to speak out in support of the Riverbank project. Um, having lived here for, for 23 years, um, I've become very aware of how the affordable workforce housing problem is starting to become very critical for this community. Um, I see this property as an ideal property for doing affordable workforce housing. I think many of us have seen that for a long time and are actually pleased to see something like this happening. Um, I am now one of 25 city employees that still live in the city of Whitefish. So there's 104 city employees. There's only 25 of us that live in the city. So that's 75% you know, of the city employees now live outside the city of Whitefish. When I first started working here you know, for 20 years ago, most people lived in the city that worked here, but that's no longer the case. So that's showing you when people come to work here, it's no longer an option for most people. They don't have an option to live, especially if they're coming from another area. It's just not an option. Um, so um, I think we just need a variety of affordable workforce housing options for people here. One thing I love about this area, it's walkable, bikeable, you can hop on the river. I mean, for especially young people coming here, this would be a fun place to live. They wouldn't have to have a car. They, you know, they'd have other options to get around. So um, I think it, you know, it just has um, really good, op it c you know, could provide some very, f uh, um, a nice kind of community feel to an affordable workforce housing um, area. So um, the last thing I'd just say is that, um, this project, I think, if done right, could really help this town remain a real town, which is something that everyone knows here is a threat. Um, unfortunately, that's just, we're a bit too popular with people that have a lot of money, and so in order to keep the town real, we have to take action. So um, that's it, but thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Karen. Aaron. <clears throat> Aaron Wallace, 265 Hawks Lake Lane, Whitefish. Um, I'm here to speak about uh, 334 Central Avenue. Um, as you guys may have seen, there's a letter and a packet in, uh, in your packet that we've submitted. After our approval of last meeting, um, we wanted to kind of go back and revisit the two conditions that were part of the approval. Uh, I asked Dave what that process would be and he outlined it would be to come and speak during public meeting uh, and then hopefully somebody would be able to take that up at the end of the meeting or prior uh, to review these two elements. Um, so the first thing is, is that the first condition was to restrict it to only retail on the first floor. Uh, we'd like to amend that condition to be uh, have the allowed uses uh, for the Old Town District uh, that's allowed north of 3rd Street. Uh, there are certain percentages of professional offices or all a series of different uses that's allowed there in that district and not just retail. So what we're hoping to do is take that zoning and just extend it down uh, for this block also for this property. That way it isn't a spot zoning saying it's only strictly retail uses. Uh, just what's north of 3rd Street um, versus what's currently on this block allows commercial uses without less, it has less restrictions on this block than the rest of the old town district. 
The second condition we'd like you guys to revisit is the uh, requirement building out to the property line on the first floor. Uh, after the approval, we went back and revisited it and took a look at what that might mean to the building. You guys in your packets have a rendering showing it out to the edge of the property line and also showing what we're proposing. We took out in that drawing the uh, patios on that side uh, and just had a straight wall and put windows out there. Um, we then took that imagery and showed it to the different neighbors of the area, different business owners in the area, and asked for their input in which they would prefer. We didn't try to say, look, if it's positive or negative, please let us know. Uh, we think this is a real positive change to keep it setbacks. There's a lot of different reasons to that, including fire access, keeping some more greenery around there, visual access to the alleyway, all the light and windows that those windows provide in the north and south side, providing setback and massing requirements related to its neighbors who aren't getting developed. Um, and so you'll see those letters in the packet that we also included. I think there's around 10 or so, and they're all very positively uh, re requesting you guys to reconsider that and keep allow us to have the five-foot setback. Um, then we also brought that to architectural review the Tuesday after, or last Tuesday, uh, and asked them the same sort of questions. What are your guys' thoughts? You'll see the letter that they produced in that. They brought up several different good points, and they were in favor of allowing us to do the five-foot setback. Um, it becomes about a 24 or so foot high brick wall off the alleyway. We got terms of prison wall thrown at us. Um, we can try to accentuate and design it as nice as we can, but that would be the reality of it. Um, the other aspect that they also showed is that, you know, if you take a look and walk down the alleyways of Central or the downtown area, most buildings are not built up to the property line. They're held back either for parking um, or off the alleyways on the sides. You take a look. The front side, you know, a lot of that are out to the face, um, but off to the sides and the alleyways, once you get past that, it, it isn't held out to the property line. So what we're asking to do is that the, no other project or building site in Whitefish is held to saying you have to build to the property line. Realistically, you can't anyways. You have to hold at least a foot off back, set offset to actually allow for footings and everything not going off your property. Um, and so we'd like you guys reconsider that. It's, there's a lot of support in the neighborhood and other people to not have hold us that setback. We've lost po possible people interest in the site once they learned that there wasn't windows available for those back units. We'd also like you to reconsider uh, having us be zoned like the rest of the old downtown district and allow the same uses which are allowed at the same percentages as the rest of the downtown. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Good evening, Mary Flowers, Community Unity Consulting, <clears throat> PO Box 3094, Kalispell. And I'm here tonight um, to talk briefly on two topics. The first is the uh, Riverbank residence um, that is before you tonight. I did submit comments at your last meeting. Um, and what I've done is I've taken those comments and now tied them more specifically to the criteria that you will be basing your decision on tonight. So I believe there are 12 findings as well as three um, benefits that are being attributed to uh, a basis for your, um, the deviations in zoning that are being, re that are being requested. Um, I would point out that one of those benefits is affordable housing, and yet I don't think that's a benefit to consider because in return the, for that city getting affordable housing, um, the developer is getting 84 additional units, of which only uh, 30, which, of which 30, 47 will be affordable, but 37 are just additional units that are coming in. And so in total, we're getting a slew of housing that isn't affordable, um, that is a concern. Additionally, um, they've also received a, a reduction in the open space they're required to. They have uh, uh, been given, they probably couldn't meet their affordable, their open space requirements if they hadn't been given reductions in parking of almost an acre. Um, it's not clear how they've calculated their open space. Um, and, you know, implementation for transportation, again, 
Um, they're not committed to building the road for Columbia, as I understand it. Instead, they're asking for tax increment financing. And so when you look at the real benefits that are being proposed for the, um, the variance in zoning, there's uh, real concerns that they're not of the kind of robust nature that I think a PUD requires of you. Um, you know, it's great they're building the trail, but that easement was already donated to the city, so they're not donating an easement on top of it, they're just don't agreeing to build a trail. Um, so there are 12 findings again I've gone through and uh, provided you uh, issues that I hope you will consider as you go through this to um, look at those findings. There's nothing in the staff report that justifies and documents the need for 90 studio apartments. Um, I appreciate Karin's comments just now, but I don't think that we have city employees that are coming to the city that are looking for studio apartments and one bedroom apartments. This is an appropriate place for residential development, but it needs to be much more diverse um, to meet the housing needs of the city. So I'll hand these out to you in just a second. Um, I also do want to point out um, uh, that uh, the property is already back on the market. Um, and I understand it was uh, purchased for some two and a half million. It's on the market again for four and a half million. Um, that's a concern that what are you really approving and who are you approving it for? And I really ask that you keep the residents of this community and their needs in the forefront as you go through and evaluate who this is being built to benefit. Um, the second item that I just wanted to bring your attention to I had the opportunity um, yesterday to listen to the video from the legislature of Senate Bill, I believe it's 16, I could have it wrong, it could be 15, but it's the legislation that David Fern is carrying on affordable housing. And this is a bill that would tap the uh, coal trust fund to allow a, uh, what they call a lot of gap funding that is needed for a lot of projects. and. Um, it just sounds like a really good bill, and I, was, I didn't, wasn't able to see what written comment was submitted, but I did see, you know, it was a packed hearing room with lots of support. People mentioned Whitefish. It would be nice to have written comments from our housing authority and from the city to support this bill as it moves forward. Um, there was some confusion that it was going to be tapping bed tax. It is not. It is. Uh, it will refund the coal trust tax, but it's a uh, really good way to use those funds in the meanwhile. And one of the additional things that uh, David said in his testimony is that kind of at the 12th hour, <clears throat> he found out that there would be, <clears throat> excuse me, some uh, limitations on the ability of these funds to be used for single family homes. And so he wants to make sure that it not only can support multifamily, but single family homes. And so I think in your comments, that would be something worthwhile to mention as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Rhonda Fitzgerald, 412 Lupfer Avenue. Um, <clears throat> I want to comment on two items on your agenda. First, the Riverbank property. Uh, I was uh, looking at MLS, and I saw that a previous PUD that you guys approved for the property next to the mall by the pond for 45 units is, has went right on the market immediately after receiving that PUD approval. And um, that's a trend that I've seen in the past where applicants come and make all kinds of very granular promises about how a thing is gonna work and what it's gonna be and what it means to the community and then pff, it's flipped. And so uh, I just wanted to point out that potential possibility for the PUD that you're looking at tonight because 
A lot of concerns were addressed with very, very specific solutions that easily could not ever come to pass because you could give a PUD for 234 units and it could be something completely different than what we've talked about the last several meetings. So I just want to make that point. And then my second, uh, my second comment is about the uh, 334 central request to reconsider the conditions of approval. And uh, I thought that I would bring you some slides because, you know, they say a picture's worth a thousand words and I know you have a long agenda and I know I'm supposed to only have three minutes. So I'm just going to review some parts of the two master plans that have provided the foundation for the success we've had in our community in the last uh, almost 15 years. And so that's the downtown master plan adopted in 2005 and the update to the downtown master plan adopted in 2015. Um, from the 2005 plan, there's a diagram on page 22 which shows the primary retail streetscape which goes from Central Avenue, on Central Avenue from well, Railway to 4th Street. So that block from 3rd to 4th was always identified as becoming primary retail with all the attributes of the three blocks north. It's on all the diagrams in the 2005 plan. To strengthen um, the streetscape includes specific design concepts that support and improve retail viability on Central Avenue. To strengthen Central Avenue's retail viability, the primary retail streetscape elements must be provided. The erosion of one or more of these elements result in a weakened retail environment. Those elements which are called out in the implementation section of the plan are required ground floor retail uses. Shopping and eating and drinking establishments are required at the ground floors of buildings fronting on Central Avenue. This requirement will ensure that continuous retail storefronts and eating and drinking establishments are promoted and maintained along Central Avenue to attract pedestrians and strengthen the shopping environment. And I have a little picture of that healthy uh, retail district as it stands today. Just to remind you of what our wonderful town looks like. These are some slides uh, of the buildings on that street. Historic, the historic character of our unique downtown includes mostly one and two story buildings. The building facades have a uniform vertical scale, narrow and tall, creating a rhythm of 25 and 50 foot width storefronts. Required build to lines ensure compatibility and harmony between buildings, enabling a series of different buildings to maintain a continuous vertical wall. Third stories must be set back 20 feet to mitigate the aesthetic impact of additional height from the street. The required ground floor active edge uses standards reinforce the continuity of pedestrian active ground level building uses. They help maintain a healthy urban district through the interrelationship of ground floor uses and street level accessibility and activities. Active edge building uses must meet required build to lines to ensure compatibility and harmony between buildings, enabling a series of different buildings to maintain or establish a continuous vertical wall. First floor build to lines must comply with a zero setback. And then from the 2015 downtown master plan land use framework, it says new development in downtown should respect historic development forms and patterns. It should be compatible with existing or adjacent building scale and massing. Downtown Whitefish's historic design is pedestrian friendly throughout the entirety of downtown. All development should replicate these characteristics. Successful retail is an indicator of a healthy downtown. Whitefish's primary retail street, Central Avenue, is now vibrant and thriving. Storefronts along the corridor are mostly occupied and shopkeeper demand is present for additional retail storefronts. To meet this demand, viable areas for expanding retail opportunities are identified in the plan. Ground floors of all buildings identified as primary storefront retail frontage should be limited to retail uses exclusively. Retail uses should be defined as establishments that offer the sale of goods, clothing, shoes, groceries, etc., sale of food and drink, restaurants, cafes, bars, etc., sale of entertainment, cinemas, nightclubs, etc. In development standards, new or renovated retail shops should be street oriented. The bulk and massing of structures should be cited to provide continuous edge to edge retail uses along identified street frontages. Those would be the ones from railway to fourth in all of the diagrams. Form and massing elements should be compatible with the existing building character. 
Active retail storefronts should foster 18-hour uses and promote an animated atmosphere by including highly transparent ground floor windows and doors. Front doors to retail uses should be required to face the street. That means not buried down a hallway inside of a maze. In the architecture review standards, which deal with central from railway to forth, it states that this area is the heart of the Old Town District, characterized by one and a half to two story mixed use buildings with retail on the main floor and offices or residential on the second story. Upper second story windows should be smaller than the main levels and vertical in shape. All building project design should be a positive complementary enhancement to the existing architecture, quality of life, and character of the Whitefish community, and particularly the Old Town District. So there's another picture of what they're talking about there. New buildings that are too tall, too massive, and out of character with the existing historic architecture create visual chaos, destroying the special character that makes our city successful. Opening the floodgates of incompatible buildings will begin an erosion and eventual destruction of downtown's historic character. Whitefish's downtown is unique and fragile. It cannot be duplicated, but it can be destroyed by new development that is out of scale with existing buildings. I was saddened to see that in the request to reconsider the conditions, a lot of very well-meaning people who did not understand the issues and did not have the background in the planning, uh, wrote letters and um, feel that the requirements would inhibit the success of a new building when in fact they would ensure the success of a building. And uh, I'm very heartened to see that people want to invest in our downtown. I just hope that you guys can hold the standards so that those investments are successful. Thank you. Thanks, Rhonda. Further public comment tonight? Just tech support. <laughs> You're good. You're done. Thanks. <laughs> um, my name is Lauren Walker. I live on Fauna Road in Whitefish. And I'm speaking about the uh, riverfront property development, former hospital. Um, I was a little despondent and wasn't even sure I was going to come tonight, feeling that maybe decisions had already been made. Um, I feel really strongly, and I agree with almost everyone that spoke tonight against this project. I want to really emphasize that they're asking for special permission. They're asking for you to change the rules for them. You do not need to approve this, and you don't need to approve it tonight. You can delay, you can think about it, you can really dive into the details before you make your decision. And I have a few points that I'd like to add um, to that thought. Um, the first is, uh, I didn't realize until Mary uh, mentioned that there were gonna be 90 studio apartments. No one wants to live in a studio apartment unless you're in New York City, and then you're psyched if you can get something, and then you live in a studio with four other people, but you don't move to Whitefish to live in a studio and apartment. It's a glorified hotel room, and after a week in one, you need to go somewhere else. So all of this extra building that they're building here seems like not really what we need for affordable housing, which I'm all for, and so grateful that you um, approved the new affordable housing over on the other side of the viaduct. There's a lot of new building going on here, and that is filling the needs that we have in this community, and I don't think that this project is one of them. Um, the sheer mass of it, it goes against the master plan of Whitefish. Um, the scale, the size, if you look at the building design standards that are written right there, the size, height, and mass must not detract from, conflict, or overwhelm the surrounding neighbors. So if the plan for this is to continue Columbia Avenue, um, and make that part of the community, having these seven massive undifferentiated buildings does not achieve that. If you drive down Columbia, you see super cute little houses with fences and little yards. That's what you see all along Columbia, except there's maybe that one big 
new house. But other than that, you see all these little houses and then boom, you're gonna come up against a massive structure, seven massive structures. It just goes right against the plan as it is right now. So unless you wanna amend the master plan, I think that you are com uh, compelled to turn this down. Um, Another reason to wait on this decision is until the master plan for 93 is complete, which I just got that email and spent a long time looking at all of those questions and answering them with a lot of thought and deliberation that you guys obviously spent putting that together and sending it to everybody in the town. Why not wait until that master plan is completed before making such an enormous decision on what that um, quarter is going to look like? Again, similar to uh, what happened on Wisconsin and just before that master plan was uh, adopted, the same um, uh, group of people uh, put through a, a huge development, uh, flattened all the trees, and is building something that is radically gonna change the nature of this town. So I would really uh, um, recommend that you wait until we know what's gonna happen with that corridor plan. Um, Another thing that hasn't been uh, really addressed is the toxic runoff into the river from all of the concrete. I know some, a gentleman spoke at the last meeting about some of the mitigating factors for that. Um, John, you probably have a lot more knowledge about that than I do, but all I know is that with the amount of concrete that's gonna go in there, there's no way to completely mitigate the runoff into the river, and that's a huge, huge problem. Again, I wanna um, emphasize that a couple people have said tonight, that property is for sale right now. So whoever's requesting these variances now are not gonna be the ones potentially that are building this. So again, um, this property is gonna be developed by we don't know who, and it could be simply extractive um, finances from this town and not really for the benefit of what this town needs. Um, so again, I wanna emphasize that they're asking for special permission. You do not need to approve it and you do not need to make a decision about this tonight. I really hope that you um, take some time to really think this through because you guys are also gonna be the ones stuck in traffic and uh, viewing our town in a totally different way than we see it now, which is quite lovely. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Who's next? Further public comment tonight? Not seeing any, I'll stay with the audience. Any volunteer uh, board reports to share with the council? How about the council? Richard, none? None tonight? No, not until the beginning of next month. Okay, anyone else? <laughs> not seeing any, we'll move on to the consent, uh, consent agenda. Any changes or additions to the January 7th meeting minutes or could I have a motion for approval? I would, <clears throat> I would move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. That was seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously. Michelle, which brings us on to our five public hearings this evening. We will start with item 6A on our agenda, which will be ordinance number 19-4, an ordinance of the City of Whitefish, Montana, approving the Riverbank Residences Plan Unit Development to develop 234 apartments in seven buildings located on two parcels comprising approximately 11.8 acres of land located at 6575 Highway 93 South in Whitefish. This will be on a first reading. As a reminder, it's a continuation from the January 7th meeting and the public hearing is now closed. I'll turn it back to the council. Uh, I would like to suggest that we begin with a motion, whatever direction that goes, and then we'll start our deliberations and discussions from there. Unless you're not ready, Richard. No, I'm. I'm not ready. Um, and I, I need some clarification, perhaps from Angie. Sure. Um, sorry. Uh, what impact, if any, does a pending sale have on our decisions with regards to? approving or not approving this PUD. In other words, it's been brought up uh, during public comment. Um, this was something I was unaware of, and so I need some clarification if you can provide it. Richard, I've actually been trying to figure that out myself, and from my standpoint, I, I don't know, <clears throat> pardon me, that there is any impact. 
I mean, if whoever they sell it to goes to develop the property, it's still going to have to be in accordance with the PUD that you approved. Either that or they're going to have to come back in to amend the PUD. So I'm not sure that who actually owns it really has any legal effect in my mind. So would the PUD, if a new owner came in and said they wanted five buildings instead of seven, or wanted to change the nature of it to uh, townhouses and uh, condos, would that still be permitted under the PUD? Um, Richard, they'd have to come back into council for something like that. Okay. Um, if it's a minor amendment, they can, they're administratively approved, but I, what you're talking about right now sounds like it would be a major amendment and they would have to come back to council. All right, that, that was one clarification sure. I really wanted ahead of any further discussion, ahead of a motion. Thank Good you. question. Adam, I had a question. <clears throat> TIF request, can you explain if there has been a request, what it would be used for in a, an amount? Uh, yeah, we've had uh, preliminary discussions um, early on as to whether or not there might be any TIF funds available. Um, and there, there are, but they are limited. Um, I wanna say that um, you know, we, we might have up to 250,000 in TIF in this budget year to do something with. Um, no, nothing's been promised because, of course, council has to approve all these things, but I think there was some feeling that, you know, by providing the affordable housing and the roads and the trails and some of the various connections and extensions that were um, desirable to the city that there could possibly be some TIF funds available. So that'll have to be up for discussion when the, the official request comes in. Okay, thank you. Richard. I have one further uh, point of clarification. Uh, at the end of last week, uh, I contacted Adam, and he then got a hold of Craig to talk a little bit about um, the De Montana Department of Transportation and their plans for that intersection of 13th and 93. And as um, Bob, uh, mentioned um, that potential of us saying this c traffic congestion brought to you by <laughs> all of us. Um, I I'm wondering if, Craig, you could brief us on what MDT's plan or plans are, uh, how they may affect the intersection, potential uh, congestion at that intersection, and then maybe some discussion of whether or not phasing could be a condition so that we would phase, if we approved the uh, concept, that we could then think about phasing the construction uh, of the buildings to match up with um, plans for that intersection so we can avoid the congestion. Does that follow? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to turn it back to Adam Craig. Uh, and whoever else needs to speak to that issue. You want me to take this one? <laughs> uh, MDT does have uh, what they call a, um, a safety project slated for the intersection of 13th and Spokane, or Highway 93. Um, they were originally planning to build that project, I believe, um, either this year or in their um, fiscal year 20. Um, however, we've made some progress with them recently uh, in moving forward with the, um, the other improvements on Highway 93, which will also likely incorporate Baker and in looking at um, the couplet that we've talked about for, for many years in uh, not only on our own transportation planning, but also um, in the recent update to the downtown business district master plan. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that project, on the, um, the Whitefish Urban project that involves 13th to, uh, to 2nd. And so with that in mind, MDT has put that intersection of 13th and Spokane on hold temporarily. 
Um, however, they have confirmed that the preliminary design for that project does include an additional southbound lane, uh, approximately um, from like the town pump to 13th. Um, so that'll provide three lanes southbound, um, a left turn, a straight, and then a straight right. Um, they will also be adding a third lane on 13th, uh, approaching um, Spokane, so westbound on 13th. As you're going past Walgreens, they'll be adding a third lane. So there'll be a left only, a straight, and a right only, um, which will make significant improvements to, um, uh, to that intersection. Typically, um, during the, the peak um, school drop-off and, and pick-up hours, um, that left-hand turn is what really backs up um, to Columbia and even as far as um, across the bridge. Uh, we're optimistic that they'll add a protected left um, or a, a left green arrow um, to that intersection to try and clear that left turn. Um, that's not a decision that's made at this point in their planning though, so we'll have to really urge them regardless of what happens with Riverbank. Um, I think that the warrants are met for that left-hand green arrow. Um, but at this point, it, it, all of these are preliminary. That, that project was put on hold until we move forward with the, the rest of that Whitefish Urban. So um, we don't have any, any kind of final plans on that, just preliminary plans, but they did show lane additions for both of those. So we don't know if that may or may not be concurrent with this planned development. Correct, I think that's fair to say. So then back to Dave or perhaps Wendy, um, is it a possible, I'm just trying to think of some conditions here, that we could condition this PUD that um, building or the build out must be concurrent or not, I, I don't want to burden that intersection um, any further. Uh, or as it develops that we're going to start to see some uh, improvement in the transportation issue at that uh, junction. Can we make those conditions? Can we make that somehow? Uh, I, I may need some help uh, <laughs> developing a condition if that's <coughs> even possible. Um, well, I guess the PUD one is good for three years. And if we don't have a time frame for when this MDT project's gonna happen, I think it'd be difficult to create a time frame. But then two, you should probably, you know, consider what was stated in the TIS, which didn't find that it was going to cause undue, you know, delays in the different intersections. And that was done by, you know, the professional traffic engineer, and I'm sure he could speak to that again. So I'm not sure what delaying it for MDT project, which who knows when that will actually happen is, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't jibe to me. Okay, I think thanks. Final question. <clears throat> Brian. Uh, Angie or Dave, whoever can answer this one. So you said a major amendment would have to come back to council, but a minor amendment already has administrative approval. What's an example of a minor amendment? So, <clears throat> so a major would be something that uh, adds density, um, changes the transportation systems in a major way. Um, a minor might be something like, you know, if they reduced it by a couple of units, um, had some minor changes in the parking lot or some things like that. Those kinds of things could be approved, but anything that um, changed the circulation, added density, um, reduced open space, any of those kinds of things would be a major amendment would have to come back to the city council. I had a question, Wendy. Um, I direct this to you just because of your involvement with our Affordable Workforce Housing Committee. With the two projects the city's involved with at both the Snow Lot and East Edgewood, we're requiring that the affordable units be proportional to the other units being built within those developments, correct? Like the, the types of housing product, whether it's a studio, a one-bedroom, or a two-bedroom apartment. That's what we're conditioning this particular project That was on. my question. Right, yeah. So the Edgewood project is 100% affordable. Right. 
and it's providing a variety of different sure. types of units. And that's what we're hoping the snow lot will do as well exactly. with ownership. and. So rental. we have the same intent with this as well. Yeah, and that's how the condition is written that um, the units, I'll just point that one out real quick. Um, so condition number 14, that again, the units would be dispersed throughout the project, that there'd be no less than 20% per building, so we'll make sure that they're throughout all the different buildings, and that the applicant would provide a variety of number of bedrooms and location to serve the greatest variety of clients. Okay. And so for like the Whitefish Crossing one, that's another example of one we've had. Um, the applicant in the city, we worked with the housing authority, what is the need, let's make sure we get you know the price point and the types of units that are going to serve the folks that are looking for them. Okay. Second question. There was a public comment made earlier that the developers requesting an open space reduction due to the density bonus. Is that? I I'm, don't recall that being. That the wasn't case. one of the. No, the deviations were to parking, and um, what was the other one? Uh, I think it was just. There was one other. Oh, the setback along setback. Columbia Avenue. Those were the only two. And that was because we were asking for a wider width. The, um, I think what was referred to is the zoning regulations under the PUD says if you're providing affordable housing, you can have reduced open space, but they're providing over 30% open space that was in their my project. As well. So they're providing a little bit more open space. Um, and then I also handed out, um, I've been visiting with Frank about the trees along uh, Highway 93 South and how they really contribute to the character of the property there, and he wanted to make sure that if some of the trees are damaged or removed for some particular reason, that we make sure that those trees are replanted. So um, I passed out a suggested addition to condition 11 um, that the protected trees um, removed or damaged during construction must be replaced with similar species and location within 10 feet of the removed trees, be no less than two inch caliper for deciduous, eight feet for conifer, and that we would review and re review that replacement plan. Um, in visiting with um, Bruce Booty about this, a two inch caliper for a deciduous and eight foot for a conifer is large enough that it'll be sustainable, but not too big that it'll die or too small that it will be, you know, not impressive of enough tree. And then also we talked about um, how do we make sure that those trees maybe stay in that area along there over time. Um, so we came up with the idea of maybe a tree preservation easement along that area. Um, that somehow that we make sure that those trees are preserved and over the long term any sort of tree removal that would have to come back to our office for some sort of review. So that was a couple of suggestions for you folks. Okay. Last question, I think I know the answer to this, but the developers also proposing and we're requiring that they actually bear the full cost for the Columbia yeah. Avenue extension, They'll be including building the Columbia. curb gutter, bike trail. Mm -hmm. Sidewalks, street trees, street, sidewalks. street, trees, street mm -hmm. lighting, etc. Yep, 15th and Columbia, they will be constructing entirely. One, one final. Richard. Maybe it's not the final question, but one more question. Uh, Craig, I just want to make sure once again, and Dave, uh, Wendy, that I think there's enough space on the Columbia extension for uh, protected, adequate bike, ped, transportation. How about once you round the corner onto 15th to get back to Spokane or 93? I think that that sidewalk narrows, but that's exactly how people are going to be able to get one of the ways they'll get across to, let's say, Safeway, uh, and then maybe to the uh, bus stop for the snow bus is what's proposed in the drawings sufficient to meet the needs of however many people are gonna live in 143 or 34 units? I think that's something we'll definitely work with the developer on as we get to um, the actual civil site plans for this project, realizing that the, you know, the multimodal transportation on <coughs> Columbia is gonna be significant. We'll wanna make sure that there's connections um, going east-west to the highway and down to the river um, to support that. So um, I don't believe there's anything shown at the conceptual level right now for a shared use path on, on 15th, um, but I think that's definitely something that we'll want to work with the developer on. Um, perhaps they can, they can speak to that in, in particular, but um, we, we realize that's, that's definitely a concern and we'll, we'll work with the developer to make sure it happens. Okay. I didn't know if I had to add a condition here. <clears throat> 
Frank. Craig, I guess this is a little bit for you or um, rhetorical, not even a rhetorical question. How I understand our desire long term to be able to reduce the number of required parking spaces on some kinds of developments um, because of trends and that kind of noise. We live in Northwest Montana, I get that. Is there any way, and Dave, you may be able to help here too, I'm concerned that to the extent we're allowing for reduced parking um, under this kind of a project over the standards um, or what our historical standards have been, that we will still have what I'll call overflow parking, that we'll end up with people trying to park uh, their second car or their third car or whatever it is on the street or someplace close on another related street. Um, then we get into the routine that we get, you end up with in the big cities where people, oh, okay, park, can't park here because, but I can park over there and I'll walk. How do we deal with that issue given the reduction in the parking that we're, we would potentially allow under this project? Is that too big a bite? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a, a Dave or a Craig, Craig question. I think uh, Chief Don. Not a Chief Don question. I mean, it's, you know, nationwide the standards for parking are, are showing more reductions that less people are driving. Um, <coughs> our standards are very generous currently, you know, on parking requirements. Um, you know, you can't really mandate where people park if it's a legal place on the street, if we're allowing on-street parking, which I believe we are, unfortunately, of that. Um, you know, people are gonna park on the streets where they can. I mean, it's, it's sort of a matter of convenience. You're not gonna park so far away that you can't get to your car. There's not really any other neighborhoods close by to there that are gonna be, you know, impacted necessarily. Um, you know, Columbia, Maybe on the other side of the bridge, somebody could park over there and walk across, but I don't think that'd be very convenient. Um, you know, the number of spaces there is going to dictate how many, you know, if there's nowhere to park, people may not have a second car. Um, but I'm pretty confident that the number of spaces they're providing is going to be adequate for what they, you know, the number of units that they have. Is this project set up so that it's effectively open parking for the whole project? Or are there going to be assigned spaces per unit? Uh, you'd have to ask the applicant on the specifics of the assigned spaces. They also have public parking for access to the river that's part of the project that's uh -huh. um, not part of their overall parking spaces. But. Mr. Mayor, it's with some reservation that I'll at least propose a, uh, a motion to see where this thing goes. Thank you. Um, I would move to approve, subject to adding several conditions. Um, ordinance 1904, um, an ordinance of the city of Whitefish approving the River Bake residence. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hennon. Frank? Um, First, um, before I add my conditions, I would like to speak a little bit to what I think is going on around here. Um, I would like for this project to be way less dense. I would like for this project to be some ownership and much more mixed types of units in there. It would make it massively more attractive to this community. 
That said, this is a commercially uh, zoned piece of property. If we choose not to approve this or condition it properly, um, all of those trees and the buffers that are provided currently on that property will, in all likelihood, go away. Yes, we will have, for a short period of time, I suspect, uh, potentially, depending upon how development goes, probably a traffic problem in that intersection. And yeah, it will be brought to you by the us if we approve it. We'll also be working to solve that problem through the approval of this PUD um, and the requirements of the infrastructure that would go along with it. Um, that said, um, I would offer two or potentially three additional um, amendments to my motion. Let's take each individually and we'll vote on those specific amendments before the original motion. Right. I would propose that uh, amendment or that condition number 11 be amended to add um, that uh, outside of the right of way, protected trees removed or damaged during construction must be replaced with similar species and located within 10 feet of the removed trees and be no less than two inches in caliper for deciduous trees and eight feet for conifer trees. Such tree replacements must be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Additionally, and to that, on that same line, if I can continue, uh, Mr. Mayor, a pr tree preservation easement. Let, let's take that okay. first as a separate amendment since you'll uh, be adding a new condition number 17. Yep. That's is there a second to Frank's friendly amendment? I'll second. Seconded by Melissa. Further discussion on the amendment? Richard. Um, has the caliper size come before the uh, parks uh, and recreation and the tree committee? Um, to discuss that because I know we have some tree adoption uh, options for larger caliper trees and um, I know that the larger the caliper uh, within reason of course uh, the better the survival will be <clears throat> um, no it hasn't because they're still private trees and I I'm not sure where Wendy, if she worked with Bruce on that, or where those came from. Yeah, it, I um, consulted with Bruce Booty, the landscape architect. But the, the tree committee did not take this up? I don't think the tree committee looks at private trees. They only look at street trees, don't they? I think this also includes the boulevard trees, does no, it not? No, this is just on private land. Just on the private? Yeah, this is not the public okay. street trees. Thank you. Wendy, this, may, may I, Mr. Mayor, yes. in, on this thing? When you and I had the discussion earlier about the calipers of trees, and I think I expressed my frustration that that wasn't good enough, and mm -hmm. I would be happy if they were larger. What I've just heard from Richard, who I think has some experience with trees, is that larger caliper trees actually have a better chance of survival than the smaller caliper trees? It might be. I would defer to Bruce's expertise, though. That's where I got it from, so. Because I would Maybe. amend my amendment in a heartbeat to make it bigger if I could possibly do it and know that there was I think a, we should ask Bruce. Maybe Bruce could answer your question for you. I think he's the most knowledgeable. Bruce, do you mind approaching? Name and address for the record, please. Bruce Booty, landscape architect, 301 Second Street, Whitefish. So I did speak with Wendy about this, and typically for street trees, we've settled as a, as a committee and with staff with parks. These are typical of what we put in the boulevards, uh, typical size and caliper. And we do that because it's true, at a certain point, smaller trees don't survive. They get beat up, uh, they get damaged bark, and we have problems with them. But also, older trees, bigger trees, have a harder time being transplanted. And so their survival rate goes down as you get beyond the two-inch caliper. So this is what we've 
had the best success with on street tree projects for 20 years, something like that. This is typical of the size we use. And that's what I recommended to Wendy. Go ahead, me. Bruce, I appreciate that. This is different. We're not planting boulevard trees here. We're right. trying to protect and incent the protection of existing older, mature trees. Right. We have seen other developments where that has been ignored. That has been a problem. And what I'm concerned about here is I want to provide the incentive for protecting the trees that we would otherwise protect here with a strong enough incentive, I could even call penalty, for failure to do so. If we can, from a arborist perspective, require and anticipate survival of a larger caliber tree, though it might be more expensive, and its failure would then require, in my view, a replacement again until they got it right, um, is that unreasonable from an arborist's perspective? for expecting that we could ask for a larger tree and, ex and have a reasonable expectation, if well cared for, that it would survive. Yep, I, again, there is no perfect answer here, but I will say that the best ballot seems to be this two inch caliper deciduous and eight foot height for the conifers. Remember, we're planting these in a buffer <coughs> So as you go up in size for the trees, the hole you have to excavate to put this in gets bigger and bigger. Okay. And then that impacts the surrounding trees. Okay. So what we're trying to do is, again, we're finding a balance. And depending on each individual location, that could vary. But that's why we chose this sort of middle of the road. Thank you. That was that made some sense. Thank you. Further discussion on Frank's friendly amendment to condition number 11. Not seeing any. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that friendly amendment to condition number 11 passes unanimously. Frank. I would add a new condition. A tree preservation easement or easements must be designated along Highway 93 South and along the Whitefish River for the long-term pre protection of the trees along this, those frontages. And the boundaries of the trees preservation easements must be reviewed and approved by the planning department before recording at the Flathead County Clerk and Recorder's Office. All work within the tree preservation easement must be approved by the planning department. And I would further add, if necessary, that under no circumstances, under no circumstances, should construction equipment or the parking of any vehicle encroach upon that easement or upon the drip lines of any of the trees within the easement. That will be added condition number 17. Is there a second to Frank's friendly amendment? I'll second. It is that, Seconded by Melissa Richard. Is that part of the existing number 17? Because we have a total, if I'm not mistaken. No, I added to 17. I added to Added it to I, 17. I added. As amended. Okay. Perfect. I, I just. What's, what's two 17. There? Sir. <clears throat> that was seconded by Melissa. Would you like to speak to your friendly amendments or as stated? I think one of the things that we have seen where there have been promises for protection of trees is that it's simply that. We have not seen real demonstrated um, interest of developers in preserving the trees that we think are important and that this community thinks is important. One of the things that we do routinely is even during construction when they are protected is that we park under them. We allow construction equipment to go over their roots. We further add fill or backfill or pile things in those areas which do nothing but damage the roots and ultimately kill those trees. The purpose of this amendment is to ensure that if we're going to approve this kind of development, one of the reasons we're doing it or would allow it is so it is appropriate 
adequately uh, screened and appropriate for the entry for whitefish. Um, I, can see, uh, I can see no way to approve this project absent at least this kind of a condition. Further discussion on the motion, which will be a friendly amendment to condition number 17. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously as well, Michelle, which brings us back to our original motion for approval as amended. Is there any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and that motion carries unanimously, Michelle. We're going to go ahead and take about a five-minute break. We'll reconvene at about 8.38. We're going to go ahead and get started. We are actually going to have to do something a little different, and I think we need to bring up some reconsiderations here. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard for those motions. <laughs> um, Mr. Mayor, uh, point of privilege. And uh, I would move, as one who voted in favor of the previous motion, I would move to reconsider the previous motion, and there will be a follow-up motion to that. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. I would then uh, move to take from the table and move to reconsider Ordinance 19-04. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Further discussion? All those? Richard? No, no further discussion. Okay. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and I believe that was unanimous as well. Richard? Um, I would like to uh, add some uh, additional conditions, and I know that there was one other condition that someone uh, had thought of uh, that we did not include the first time around, um, and I don't know who had it, uh, was talking about it. Suggested by staff. It was suggested by staff for a um, bus parking. Bus shelter. Bus shelter. <clears throat> Wendy? Yeah, that's on the... Uh, Page 166 of the, the big packet, um, a suggested condition, well, I suppose it'd be like 21 now. We're gonna kinda have to do some renumbering here. Um, that a bus shelter to Eagle Transit and Montana Department of Transportation specifications be installed and maintained. That's on page 166 of the packet, on 93, to the yeah, north side. Yeah, 93. Mm -hmm. And that would be uh, condition Probably number like 20. Probably like 20 or 21. It'd be 21 now. Well, I think we just, we amended condition 11 and we amended condition 17. Well, we added 17 and renumbered the subsequent added section. Okay. So, so I think it, it ended up being 21. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would move that we add a condition 21 that a bus shelter to Eagle Transit and Montana Department of Transportation specifications must be installed and maintained. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Yeah. Melissa. <laughs> With the installation of the bus shelter, does does that impact some of the trees that we were trying to protect? Oh, excuse me. Um, I don't believe so. It's going to be located within the right of way, and those trees I think are just off the right of way. So it's a really wide right of way. When you're driving down the road and you notice that kind of meandering sidewalk, I think it'll be in that vicinity. It'll be closer to the curb. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Richard. So we're now up to number 22. This from um, the Bike Ped Committee. Um, they asked for... We, did not, we didn't vote on I'm condition sorry. number 21. We'll take that vote now. All those in favor of condition number 21, raise your hand, and that's unanimous as well, Michelle. <coughs> Richard. Um, I would move a uh, condition 22, which is come, uh, comes from the Bike Ped Committee, uh, to include a hardened trail um, and launch site and public dock uh, as diagram or as shown on the um, plan submitted by uh, the proponent. And that would be condition number 22? That, that'll be condition number 22. Wendy, do you have a comment before we get a second? Yeah. Um, condition number 18, we did, um, came from when we met with the Ped Bike Committee, that uh, we would want the public parking 
with a public easement along with an improved river access, whether this is in the form of a hardened access point or a dock. So that was part of condition number 18, 18. which came from the pedestrian bike, because they said one or the other at that committee meeting that I was at. The, at the last committee meeting, they, were, they wanted to make sure that that trail uh, was hardened, that could be compacted gravel, <clears throat> down to a wider launch area and include a dock. That's what the bike ped committee asked for. Oh, so they changed at this last they did. meeting. Can we amend number 18? To you could amend 18 uh, to include that. Can you repeat that, please? Amend condition number 18 to <clears throat> include a path and a broader launch and watercraft removal area plus a dock. Is that clear, Wendy? Before I ask for a second. <clears throat> so we have, uh, I'm just trying to figure out how to add this in here. So we want the parking north of the clubhouse and a, so we have direct access from the site to the river in the form of a hardened path of a hardened path and, and then um, just a second let me located within the public easement along an improved river access I'm going to strike whether this is an access in the form of a hardened access point and a dock yes okay that's so there's room for people to pull their paddle boards and canoes and things up um, without getting into the muddy bank and, and sure. that sort of thing. That was the purpose right. that the bike ped had in mind. Is that amendment to condition 18 clear with the council? Is there a second to that friendly amendment? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Fury. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously as well, Michelle. Richard. So now we're, I'll propose um, condition 22, unless I overlooked it, uh, with regards to bike pad, or uh, bike racks. So um, the, addish, the addition, require the addition of adequate, an adequate number of bike racks at uh, each proposed building. Is there a second to that motion, which would be condition number 22? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hennon. Further discussion? What is adequate? I, I don't mean to be irritating. I just, I, Okay, uh, bike racks be provided uh, at each of the seven units. Of the seven units. Does that answer your concern, Frank? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I understand. That's okay with the second. That's Andy? fine. Or Ryan? Okay. Brings us back to the motion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's what we're doing. Condition number 22. That's all right. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that amendment passes unanimously, which will be condition number 22, Michelle. Anything further, Richard? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, condition 23. Um, Wendy has pointed out that it's uh, redundant, uh, but I have had several people ask me to do this, and so I'm going to, uh, and that is include a condition that specifically says short-term rentals shall not be permitted. Is there a second to that friendly added condition number 23? Second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that passes on a four-to-one vote with Councillor Hennon voting in opposition. Richard. Condition number 24. Four, uh, the developer will work with, um, will, will work, 
The developer will work to ensure the adequacy of the multimodal transportation aspect of the PUD. Fair enough. That will be added condition number 24. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. If I may, this Please. is just to make sure that we have an adequate bike ped connection network throughout the entire project uh, to be able to move people in some fashion other than their automobiles. Fair enough. Further discussion on the motion, which will be condition number 24. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that's unanimous as well, Michelle. I think I'm out of conditions. Now, Robert's rules, do we need to now motion on the original yes, motion as amended? Yes, we'll need a, another motion uh, because it's been modified. We'll need another motion uh, on uh, because we have a new motion. Please do. Frank. Is is the, this development going to be required as a development to clear and maintain clear sidewalks during the winter months? Yes, by ordinance, by existing ordinance, they will have to maintain sidewalks for snow and ice. Can I just clarify that applies to bike paths as well or no? No. I don't think so. Okay. Those are shared paths as described, so yes, they would, I would think. No, it's going to be a city bike path, right. and the city oh. maintains those. Okay. Yeah. Just, just the one along the river. The one down to the river is going to be privately maintained. But the sidewalks within the subdivision or the, the PUD um, are the responsibility for clearing, and those are oftentimes, at least the, the way it's described, are um, shared bike ped paths to the sidewalks. I, I think just on Columbia, it's a bike path, but on 15th, it's a sidewalk, shared yeah, sidewalk. Sorry, I was, I was responding to sidewalks and shared use paths within the public right of way are the responsibility of the adjacent property owner. So I would move to approve um, the reconsidered ordinance 19-04. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign. And that carries unanimously as well, Michelle. We'll move on to item 6B, which is a consideration of a request from Aaron. McPherson for a conditional use permit to convert an existing detached garage into a guest house located at 220 Peregrine Lane, property zone WLR, which is our one family limited residential district. This will be WCUP 18 13. Bailey. I've got to make sure they're both, ah, good. They were both named the same presentation, so right. I wanted to make sure I was getting mine. Since I have three in a row, I just pulled mine up, so. Thanks. Um, okay. So, uh, the applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to convert an existing detached garage into a guest house. The detached garage was, con garage was constructed in 1998, and it included a bonus area above. The applicant is um, proposing to remodel the garage so that both floors are used for living purposes. Um, the garage is approximately 700 square feet and therefore is too large to become an accessory apartment. The structure does comply with all setback requirements for a structure larger than the 600 square foot um, footprint, um, in addition to the building height and the lot coverage requirements. Um, it's accessed from Peregrine Lane, which is a privately maintained road. The subject property is approximately a little over 20,000 square feet in size. Um, it is currently developed with a single family residence in the detached garage. It's surrounded by residential uses. It's zone WLR, which is our one family limited residential district. Um, the growth policy designation is a suburban residential, um, which actually does not correspond to the WLR. The WLR corresponds to the urban designation. 
Uh, we did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners within 150 feet of the parcel on November 30th. Um, we emailed advisory agencies, placed a legal um, in the Whitefish Pilot on December 5th. Um, when I wrote the staff report, I had received four comments. Um, two were in opposition of the proposal, and one was in opposition, but then ended up um, submitting another comment in support of the proposal. And then I did have one additional comment that was submitted prior to the planning board meeting, which is included in your packet, um, and that was in support if it was not turned into a rental unit. So, um, so just kind of hitting the highlights of the criteria for conditional use permit. Um, as I said, the subject property is zone WLR, which is not, which is listed under the urban designation, not the suburban residential. Um, however, the WLR only permits single family residences, and that is similar to the zones listed under suburban residential um, designations. Um, so therefore, it is compliant with the suburban residential since it only allows single family um, dwellings as well. Um, the development is consistent with the purpose and intent of the regulations. Um, there are sections um, in our performance standards for guest houses and the, pro the proposal does appear to meet all of those um, requirements as well. Um, the performance standards do state that no rent may be charged or received for the guest house unless it is um, compensation for a domestic worker or somebody who's living on the premises that's working for the property owners. Um, and that is in a deed restriction that they would have to um, uh, record with the, the county before they could be approved for a building permit. Um, it would be accessory to the single family home, adequate parking would be provided. Um, as I said, it does meet or exceed the existing setbacks um, for a primary structure since it's bigger than a 600 square feet. Um, doo -doo -doo. Um, for parking, they are required to provide two parking spaces for the single family dwelling unit. And then for the guest house, they are required to provide one off street space. Um, the proposed parking, um, or the proposed lot does provide adequate space to accommodate all the parking needs on site. Um, there is an attached garage to the house, as well as the detached garage that they're looking at. Um, so between that and then the existing driveway, they do have adequate parking off the street for their um, proposal. Um, the property is serviced by municipal water and sewer. Um, water and sewer connections are required for the guest house. Um, they, as a proposal, it's for an interior remodel, so there's no new impervious surfaces that are proposed at this time, but anything new would be looked at by the Public Works Department during building permit review. Um, it's located at the end of Peregrine Lane, which is a privately maintained road that does connect to Armory, Armory Road. It's approximately 465 feet from the intersection of Dodger Lane and Armory Road, and then a half a mile from the Armory Road and the East 2nd Street um, uh, Junction. Um, uh, Armory Road is open to the public and is owned and maintained by the City of Whitefish at this location. Uh, traffic impacts are anticipated to be minimal since it, it does include a single family residence. It's located within an um, existing neighborhood of similar uses. Um, I don't want to keep repeating the same things over, especially since you've read the packet. Um, uh, context of existing neighborhood. Um, the existing neighborhood is a single family residential, as I mentioned. Um, so the proposed use is not expected to impact or change the character of the district or of the neighborhood. Um, there was one question that was brought up by the adjacent landowners, um, and that was in compatibility of the project and their recorded CCNRs for their subdivision. Um, as you know, we don't, the city does not enforce CCNRs. That's a civil agreement between property owners owners um, within their development, um, but we also don't want to accept applications that obviously are in conflict with those. Um, however, uh, the CCNRs state that it's supposed to be used for single family residential purposes only. Um, in our zoning regulations, our guest house does define that as being accessory to a single family residential dwelling. So based on our definition, we do consider the use of the guest house as an accessory use and therefore would be compliant with their CCNRs um, of their subdivision. So it would be consistent with the existing zonings and the structures that are built out there in that, in that neighborhood. Um, so staff recommended approval of the conditional use permit with seven conditions. Um, the planning board met on December 20th and considered the request. There were no members of the public that spoke at the hearing and I did attach those draft minutes as part of your packet. Um, following the, the hearing, the planning board, um, they did modify, propose to modify finding a fact number four. They changed <coughs> one word about signage. They wanted to say instead of no signage is proposed, they want to say no signage is permitted. Um, and so that is a modified finding 
remaining a fact I included for you this evening. Um, and then they did pass the um, request recommendation unanimously to recommend approval so as well. So, and I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions for Bailey? <clears throat> Not seeing any. Thanks, Bailey. We did, did advertise for a public hearing, and we'll hold that public hearing now. Aaron, did you have anything to add to Bailey's staff report? Yeah. Okay, great. Any public testimony this evening on this item? Public comments? Not seeing any. I'll close the public hearing and turn it back to the council. Andy. I would move to approve WCUP 18-13 with modified findings of fact and the seven attached conditions of approval as recommended to us by our esteemed planning board on December 20. 2018. Thank you, Andy. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanim unanimously as well, Michelle. <clears throat> we'll move on to item 6C, which is a consideration of a request from James Dodkin from BCD Engineering for Big Mountain. Vista preliminary plat to subdivide a property into two parcels located at 441 Armory Road, which is zone WCR, which is our county residential district. This will be WPP 18-12. Bailey. Okay. So the applicant is proposing a two-lot residential subdivision on a total of five acres. The gross density of the subdivision is 0.4 dwelling units per acre. Each lot will be two and a half acres in size. Uh, the lots will each have frontage and driveways along Armory Road, which at this location is a county maintained road. Um, since only one new lot is being created, the subdivision is exempt from parkland dedication and they have not requested any subdivision variances. Uh, the property is currently vacant. It is zoned WCR, which is our country residential district. Um, it's surrounded by a mixture of county zoning and city zoning. Um, and then there's uh, residential to the south, um, the airport and the railroad to the north. The east is currently vacant. Um, and then the west is the city armory park. Um, we did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners within 300 feet of the subject property since it's a major subdivision, and that was on November 27th. We also posted a sign on the property, um, emailed advisory agencies, and placed the legal in the paper on December 5th. Um, I've only had one comment that was received on the project, um, and it was actually from MDT, and it was that they have no comment at this time. So, um, But they commented, so that was, that was a good. <laughs> um, just um, hitting the highlights of the re review criteria, criteria. Um, the fire marshal has reviewed the project and does um, he has concerns on the overall length of the driveway for the flag lot since it'll be over 300 feet long um, depending on future home construction on lot one as well. Um, so as a condition of approval um, we are requiring a note on the face of the plat that the driveways must be constructed to a minimal travel surface width of 20 feet with a turnaround installed at the end that's compliant to current fire codes. Um, additionally, the 20-foot 20, 20 surface width must be maintained in all seasons to allow for emergency access. Um, and then under our zoning regulations, the first 80 feet of the driveway shall must be paved, um, and then the remainder of suitable um, tra travel surface. Um, as I said, the lots are proposed to access off Armory Road, which is a county-maintained road at this location. There is not an internal subdivision road. Um, they're proposing individual driveways for each lot, and each driveway location would be um, reviewed and approved by the Public Works Department at the time of a building permit application. Um, uh, there's no frontage improvements that would be required along Armory Road since it's still a county-maintained road at this location. Um, but the applicant will be required to pay cash in lieu of sidewalks along their side of Armory Road for their, their entire frontage. Uh, the proposed subdivision would generate approximately 20 total daily trips, so no traffic impact study was required since it's less than our 200-trip threshold. Um, Effects on wildlife, there's no mapped wildlife habitat or seasonal migration routes, um, but the lots do comply with the minimum two and a half acre lot size, and so those larger lot size do allow for preservation of open space in the edge of town to facilitate wildlife as well. Um, this area is well known for having high groundwater, um, but it does depend on specific property locations. So the Public Works Department, we are aware that it does exist in this area due to other subdivision applications. Um, we are proposing a condition of approval that a note be placed on the face of the plat that basements or crawl spaces are not permitted um, since groundwater is assumed to be within six feet of the ground um, surface level. 
Um, each lot will be required to maintain stormwater on an individual basis. Um, obviously, high groundwater can impact stormwater um, detention plans or management. Um, and all official stormwater plans would be completed, uh, reviewed by the Public Works Department at the time of future building permit applications. Um, they are proposing to utilize individual wells on each lot. City water has not been extended um, down this portion of Armory Road. It currently ends at the intersection of Dodger Lane and Armory Road, which is a little over 1,000 feet, 1,160 feet, um, from the southwest corner of the subject property. Um, the DEQ and department, or DNRC, do have standards for new well construction um, and location, and so they will have to comply with those standards. Um, they are proposing to utilize city sewer that is extended out uh, to this area along Armory Road, um, and individual service lines will be um, installed to each of the proposed um, lots. Um, as I mentioned, um, they're exempt from the parkland dedication because only one lot is being created. Um, it's also directly adjacent to Armory Park, so that's a, a perk for them. Um, the property has historically been used um, for agricultural and for hay production. Um, we do... I, Imagery from Google Earth shows it as early as the 1990s, is as early as the um, imagery goes, but um, as recent as 2017 is the current imagery. Um, so there are also adjacent properties in the area that have been used for agricultural purposes and are continuing to do, to do that. Um, so we are recommending a condition of approval that a note be added to the face of the plat indicating the presence of agricultural uses in the area for any future homeowners, just to be aware of that. Um, Um, so, staff uh, recommended approval of the application subject to 13 conditions. Um, the planning board did meet on December 20th of 2018 and considered the request. Uh, the applicant and the applicant's representative were present at the meeting to answer any questions. There were no other members of the public that spoke, um, and I did include those draft minutes. Um, and I know Richard had asked me to talk with Travis about the access for the fire marshal or for the, um, for the property, and he said as long as they do have adequate turnaround. He would not require residential sprinkling. Obviously, it'd be better if they do, but our standards just say as long as they have the 20-foot wide surface and the adequate turnaround, that that was enough for him. So, um, and then following the uh, planning board, the hearing, they did vote unanimously to recommend approval of the application. So, I'm happy to answer any other questions if you have. Thanks, Bailey. Any questions for Bailey, Andy? Mm -hmm. uh, Bailey, just. As kind of a general practice, we typically try and discourage the creation of flag lots, and, mm -hmm. but that's exactly what we're doing here. Why are we okay here? You know, I know we do allow them as a last kind of possible um, scenario or last possible access for that. Um, because of the two and a half acre size, that is the only other, only way to split the lot. They wouldn't have another way of splitting it to keep that two and a half acre minimum. So. That would, yeah. Further questions? I just a general question. I think mm -hmm. it's probably more directed to Craig. But Craig, over the last six months, we've had a subdivision to the east of this property where we required them to extend sewer at their cost. So five to seven wells were going in in this area over the last year. At what point as a city do we kind of have that forward vision to say, maybe it's time to extend water? and so we're not burdening folks with having to install wells. Yeah, you know, sewer was a, a, an easier requirement for us to tackle because it did extend to the, the western lot line of that subdivision. Um, with respect to water, we're close to 1,100 feet from uh, the western edge of this subdivision. Um, and so it, it's not necessarily fair to require um, this applicant to extend water. If the city wanted to um, to budget to, to share in that project, I think it's something we could do, but um, we haven't shown any water extension um, in this area in our capital improvement program, and so uh, the funds just aren't currently available. They're not, and I'm certainly not advocating that we place the burden on the, the applicants right, here sure tonight, <laughs> but I just think as a, as a willing partner, when we yeah. have opportunities to extend infrastructure, in anticipation of future growth, perhaps yeah, we should look at that. Traditionally, the way that we have extended, you know, utilities in the city being water, sewer, and streets is through, um, you know, 
private construction through subdivision. Right. Um, it gets tricky in this case where we don't have water up to the limits of of the city. Um, so, you know, it really becomes a funding question. Um, you know, I think we could look at the use of, of impact fees. This would be an extension of service and a, um, an increase in, in our capacity uh, and ability to, to serve this area. Uh, and maybe that's something we'll continue to do as, as this area develops. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. I just also wondered if it was, because we also don't have um, the whole street right of way. We only have half. Does that play into that at all? I mean, would you have to have both sides of the street annexed in in order to extend water? You know, right now the, uh, the sewer utility in this area is along the south side of Armory Road mm -hmm. um, and the water mains on the north side. So I think we do have right of way to get it done. Right. Um, <clears throat> the sewer main does cross Armory um, for the most recent extension that was done, but we did require that that applicant um, leave room for a future main, for a future water main extension. So I don't think right of way is an issue. It's a good okay. point, though. We don't currently own the south half of Armory. It's a, um, a county right of way. Okay, great. Thanks for the answer. I see the applicant's technical representative, and I think the applicants are here as well. Do you have anything additional to add this evening? Good evening, Council. My name is Andy Bestwick, and I'm with BCD Engineering. I live at 28 Willowbrook Close. And uh, James Dodkin, the applicant, is not uh, able to be here tonight. He's got some work obligations. But he did want me to ask um, <clears throat> to consider, for the council to consider repealing condition number nine of uh, the approval list. That one states that cash in lieu of sidewalk be paid. And the reason that we feel that this is justified, first, is because subdivision of this property doesn't require any public infrastructure improvements. We're not extending a water main, we're not extending a sewer main, we're not extending a storm sewer main, and we're not building any roads. So my question to you guys is, why are we on the hook to pay for a sidewalk? Um, next, as of right now, what Craig was talking about, we don't have water available to the site, which creates a financial burden for the developer, because instead of hooking up to a water main, He's got to drill a couple wells. So I guess my point is if the city isn't able to provide public infrastructure in the form of a water main, why is the developer required to provide public infrastructure in the form of a sidewalk? And he also wanted me to relay, James did, that he's not opposed to paying for a sidewalk and having a sidewalk, but he has concerns with what Craig was saying earlier that the city doesn't own both sides of the road and when will the city own both sides of the road, and will he ever get to use the sidewalk that he's paying for? So if it is decided that this condition stands, he would like some type of guarantee to say, you know, within five years, he wants to be using the sidewalk that he paid for. So I appreciate the time and look forward to your deliberation. Thanks, Andy. Mm -hmm. yep. Further public testimony tonight. Not seeing any, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and turn it back to the council. Richard. Uh, a couple of technical questions first, if I might. Um, what happens, um, because in the adjoining property, they produce their well log, as I remember. We know that this is an area of high groundwater. Their static well was five feet. Uh, which tells me that the potential for contamination is much higher than a much deeper well. Um, if the wells become contaminated in this area, is it the homeowner's responsibilities then to pay for the extension of the water surface service? It would be, yeah. Um, and as Bailey <coughs> noted, that is a, a condition that's really regulated by DEQ. Um, we know of um, of some contamination that's been reported in wells in this area, uh, but I believe most recent groundwater um, sampling results have been clean and comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act um, in terms of private wells, and so um, that's not currently a concern. But you know, any well that's drilled for drinking water would be much deeper, and 
Um, I don't know if it's a consolidated aquifer or a confined aquifer they'd be going into or not, but um, they would would have to, um, you know, pump the well. They'd have to produce water um, and and sample the water, and it would have to be approved by DEQ in order to um, to permit it for potable source. Okay. Do you want me to address the cash and lieu because that was a major discussion at planning board? Briefly, sure. Uh, very briefly, um, it was pointed out that um, the sidewalk uh, there is it's part of our uh, bike ped uh, master plan, the extension of the bike ped or bike path out that way, and so uh, this would um, this cash would go eventually to uh, help in that zone. Um, for the extension of the bike path. Is that a pretty good summary of how we discussed that at uh, the planning board? Yeah, I, th I think it's also fair to note that um, applicants have the option of installing the sidewalk themselves um, or paying the cash in lieu. So uh, if the applicant were interested in installing the sidewalk and using it immediately, that's also an option. It, of course, wouldn't connect on either side, but um, the cash in lieu is um, an opportunity the city provides where areas don't have connecting sidewalk. That's all. Motion. Frank. Why not? Um, I would move to approve uh, WPPP 18-12, uh, or consider a request from uh, James Dawkin of um, CB, BCD Engineering for Big Mountain Vista Preliminary Plat subdivided property into two parcels are located at 441 Armory Road, Armory Road. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hartman. Further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and that motion carries unanimously, Michelle. We'll move on to item 6D of our agenda, and this is a consideration of a request from Bald Eagle LLC and Nicole Erickson for a conditional use permit to construct a mixed-use building with a winery on the first floor and three residential units on the second floor located at 20 Spokane Avenue in our WB3, or general business district, and this will be WCUP 18-14. Okay, so the applicant is requesting approval of a conditional use permit to develop a mixed-use building at 20 Spokane Avenue. 20 Spokane Avenue, I said really fast. Um, the existing building would be remodeled and expanded to include a winery on the first floor and then three residential units on the second floor. The total building footprint is approximately 3,772 square feet. A uh, conditional use permit is required for the proposed use as the winery is similar to a microbrewery or micro distillery. Um, and as no food would be provided, we would consider it at a bar under our zoning regulations. Um, the applicant is proposing four covered parking spaces for the residential units at the rear of the property adjacent to the alley. Um, vehicle access to the property is from the frontage along Spokane Avenue or the existing alley along the west side of the property. Um, they are also required to obtain a permit from the Department of Revenue for production and consumption of wine on the property. Um, so the subject property is approximately 6,500 square feet. Um, it is currently developed with a commercial one-story building, um, and so they're proposing just to expand it on the second floor. Uh, the property is zoned WB3, which is our general business district, and it is located within our Old Town Central District. Um, it's surrounded by commercial uses to the northwest and south, and then the Whitefish Middle School um, to the east, and all of that is zoned WB3 as well. Uh, the growth policy designation is core commercial, which does correspond to our WB3 uh, zoning district. We did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners within 150 feet of the property on November 30th. We also emailed advisory agencies and placed a notice in the Whitefish Pilot on December 5th, and I've had no comments um, received on the project. Um, or actually, I may have had one comment um, received. Um, the, it was in the planning board packet, sorry. Yeah, it was in the packet. I 
I forgot. I usually write my notes next to it to mention that, and I didn't. But I was like, I know I got one in support, I remember. Um, so uh, the growth policy compliance, as I said, it does uh, identify this area as core commercial that is consistent with our WB3 zoning district. Um, the downtown master plan, this is located within that plan as well. Um, that was approved in, in 2015 and does identify the subject property as a commercial element within our land use framework, um, which is consistent with the proposed uses. Um, this section of Spokane Avenue is identified as an extension of the Whitefish Promenade, but there are no changes um, proposed on the west side on this property location. Um, all of the proposed changes to enhance the promenade are depicted on the Whitefish Middle School side of that. Um, um, let's see, do, 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 do. Um, since it's located within the Old Town Central District, residential uses are not permitted on the ground floor, um, so they don't have any there. Um, the WB3 does not require any setbacks along Spokane Avenue um, or on the side and rear property lines since it's surrounded by commercial zoning. Um, the plans do show the existing two-foot setbacks on both the northern and the southern property line that are just adjacent to those existing commercial buildings. And as I said, they're not changing the footprint of the downstairs, they're just going up with the second floor. So that um, will continue those um, setbacks. Um, there is not a residential density standard in the WB3. Parking generally becomes our limiting factor for residential units. Um, they are required to provide um, one space per unit with our parking standards in the WB3 for units located above um, ground non-residential um, uses. Um, and no parking is required for the commercial area since it's exempt and under our standards. Uh, so they are meeting the parking requirement with four parking space provided. They're only doing three units, so they're actually providing one extra space um, at the rear of the property. Uh, the zoning permits maximum building height of 45 feet or three stories. Um, no portion of the building is actually proposed to exceed 35 feet since it's only two stories. So it um, does not have to have the 20 foot setback off of the street right of way as some of our larger buildings downtown do. Um, and these would be, are met and would be confirmed at the time of building permit as well. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, access requirements are being met. As I said, it's, there's an existing alley on the west side of the property and then Spokane Avenue off in the front as well. Um, the building will be required to have a full sprinkler system and full monitored alarm system as required by the fire marshal. Um, and the fire marshal will review engineering and building plans to ensure all the emergency standards are met for this type of occupancy and um, proposed use. Uh, traffic would enter and exit the property from the alley um, that extends between Railway and First Street, um, and there's additional circulation available off of Spokane Avenue. Um, as I said, no changes to the footprint of the existing building is proposed, and therefore no additional landscaping is required at this time. Um, the rear of the property is already paved, so they're not adding any new impervious surface. It's already paved for parking in the back. They're just proposing a carport over the rear. Um, Downtown area does have an existing stormwater drainage system and the project will require review by the Public Works Department at the time of building permit to see if any changes to the system require an engineered stormwater plan. Um, uh, the proposed winery, they're actually gonna um, take wine juice concentrate that's actually made off-site and then add the yeast to begin the fermentation process at this property. Um, so over a two to three month process, the wine goes through a series of different processes that I'm sure Nicole can give way more information on than I can. Um, but there may be odors that are associated um, with a few of those, but they should be minimal and not hazardous or anything like that. Um, um, they are proposing some residential, or excuse me, residential uses would have typical hours of operation for um, just like any other uh, residential use. And then they are proposing some um, hours of operation for the winery. Um, and then they would be required to comply with any regulations imposed by the Montana Department of Revenue for hours of operation and consumption. Um, so, do, 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 do. Uh, the proposal, as I said, is to add a second floor to the existing commercial building and be under the 45 feet maximum height. So the reduced height um, would match the surrounding buildings and would reduce the mass and scale um, of the building. And all of that would be reviewed by the Architectural Review Committee um, to determine um, if there are changes um, or there are any impacts to the mass and scale with the surrounding area. Um, the existing neighborhood is predominantly commercial along this block. There are some residential uses within the downtown also located above commercial buildings, um, and so it's not out of character with this existing area. Um, so 
staff uh, recommended approval of the conditional use permit with 10 conditions that I attached in the staff report. Um, the planning board met on December 20th and considered the request. Uh, there were no members of the public that spoke other than the applicant and their representative, and I did attach those um, draft minutes for you as well. Um, so following the hearing, the planning board, um, they moved to recommend approval of the project, but it failed on a roll call vote tied three to three. Um, and uh, we had a full board, but Rebecca had to recuse herself because she wasn't present when I had my presentation of it. Um, so I just kind of wanted to go over some of the planning board's discussion since we don't usually get a tied, tied vote for projects. Um, they mainly focused on the location of the project across from Spokane, uh, across Spokane Avenue from the main entrance of the Whitefish Middle School. Um, I did contact the Department of Revenue just to see what their requirements are for a winery and being close to churches, schools, that kind of thing, um, to determine if there was any minimum distance that they were required to be. Um, and I did talk to their special for the Flathead Valley, who deals with all the permitting just for the Flathead Valley. Um, and she said that unlike a retail beer and wine license, they would consider the winery to be a manufacturing license, which has no distance requirements from schools or churches versus an actual consumption um, retail restaurant beer and wine license. Um, as well, uh, we do have the ordinance that was passed by the city in 1997 that did um, eliminate any distance requirements between the establishment and churches and school um, if it's within the WB3 zone because almost all of downtown is within 600 feet of the middle school. So just about every bar or restaurant wouldn't be able to have a beer wine license. So that was done in 1997 as well, just for your information. Um, and then following the planning board meeting, the applicant, they did submit her, submit her, I can't talk now, um, submit a letter indicating some revisions um, to the project to mitigate some concerns that were raised at the planning board, um, including some hours of operation and some facade changes as well. Um, and I just wanna note two things is one, um, staff has a difficult time enforcing hours of operation, especially when they're after we leave for the day at five o'clock, so that's just something to, to consider. Um, and then also like to note that the architecture review standards do include specific requirements in regards to openings for doors and windows when a building is located within our Old Town Central District. So that would come into play, um, and the architectural review committee would look at that um, after the CUP were to be approved. Um, and that's just something that the plans that may were submitted by the applicant may not be the final plans that the Architectural Review Committee would approve. So just wanna make that note. Um, but otherwise, I'm happy to answer questions. And Aaron and Nicole have sat around for the whole meeting, so <laughs> they're here if you guys have questions as well. Questions for Bailey. Frank. Bailey, I note um, one of the proposals uh, that they've, they've adjusted the facade to remove windows below six feet, is that what I'm reading? Mm -hmm. How is that gonna work in the old town? We can't do that. That Well, and that's, that's the concerns that we have. Is So the planning board, um, they had concerns with students being right across the street, being able to just look into the restaurant or look into the, into the winery itself. Um, and so that was the applicant's proposal was, well, okay, we can raise the windows, but again, it doesn't, it doesn't comply with the architecture review standards from what I was reading, but I can't, they won't look at the project until it gets approval. So it's kind of almost that catch 22 Is feeling. It, I'm, I also think about um, the restaurant on the corner of Central and, um, and 93, um, they use shades to, mm -hmm raise essentially the view lines into the building um, during various times of the day for various mm -hmm. reasons. That's permitted in WB2. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'd also like to know, I don't believe the firebrand is again right across from the school and I don't believe, I think they may have some tinted windows, they may do shades as well, but they do have a full set of windows as well along that side of the street. So, right. um, and there's a number, obviously a number of businesses from Jersey Boys to everybody that do have windows down there too, yeah. so. And, and how do we deal with the issue of hours of operation in terms of 
if this were to be approved and we wanted that to be a condition, we would have to add that as a condition as opposed to simply the proposal from the mm -hmm. applicant saying, well, this mm -hmm. is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. if we're going to approve this thing. It needs to be a condition, does it not? Yeah, and, and Mike, the only concern I do have, again, with enforcement of that, because typically it's always hours of operation. So, I mean, I don't know if, if Chief Dial has any, you know, if they deal with that a lot as well, but I don't think so. So then it's getting somebody to submit a written complaint and somehow verify going out after hours that they are, in fact, violating their their um, hours of operation, or even, say, if they open at 4, well, if they open at 3.45, are we going to go give them a zoning violation for being open 15 minutes early or revoke their CUP for being 15 minutes early, um, as well as the Department of Revenue has their own standards for what their hours of operation are as a state. So that would be the other thing is, are we infringing on any hours of operation that the state legally has as well? So those would just be my concerns. But yes, we you could put out conditions for hours of operations if we choose to. So. Further questions? Not seeing any. Okay. We did advertise for a public hearing on this request, and we'll hold that public hearing now. Aaron or Nicole, did you have anything to add? Hi, thank you. Aaron Wallace, 265 Hawks Lake Lane. Um, Yes, uh, I'm here to certainly answer any sort of questions that you guys have related to the design of the project. I'll go over things real quickly and then a few of the adjustments that we've made since the planning board meeting. Um, so basically what we're taking is the existing Whitefish Builders building and the haircut place there um, that has an older building towards the front and in addition they put in the back. The back area is uh, kind of a large vaulted space that was built to have second story over the top of it. Uh, and then parking space out in the back. We're going to take some of that parking space up to have a covered parking for four parking spots plus drive-through access plus another parking spot basically on the side. So there's quite a bit of some room back there for parking facilities and other elements. Um, we're going to put three residential units up on the second floor, do a gabled roof, some front patios off the off both sides for that. Um, the winery itself basically consists of uh, a back production room. Again, Nicole can speak a little bit more on the production technique, but it's a large open vat system similar to kind of what we did at Spotted Bear. They take wine concentrate or juice concentrate and turn it into wine. It's all done at room temperature, nothing's heated or vented off. That really is a hot produced item. Um, then what we have is a couple of viewing rooms or private rooms that look into the winery uh, or the production area uh, that are a little bit more private rooms. And then we have an area towards Spokane and the old part of the building that is kind of a bar slash tasting room set up. Uh, there will be some food available there that complements wine, such as cheeses and chocolates and some meats and things like that. So there was sir, food served in some manner, I guess you could put it that way. Um, we've also changed kind of the plan based on the comments that we got from the planning board. One of them was that we uh, actually, we need two exits because of the occupant load. We're just over 100 people there. So we put a, a, a hallway through the, the production area to a back door off of the alleyway. Uh, if you look at the existing front facade, there's actually two entrances, one for the Whitefish Builders portion of it and then one for the hair salon area. We removed the uh, entrance off of the north for the hair salon area. Uh, then we kept the one off of the south side. Also, uh, as what we've kind of ran into with Casey's, you can't actually exit the building and occupant load like that and swing a door out into the sidewalk. So to meet code, we've actually bumped that entrance area, which is kind of a glass facade, back into the building three or four feet to allow the door to swing then into kind of a vestibule area and then somebody be able to exit onto the sidewalk. That gets the door swinging and hitting people into the in, uh, walking on the sidewalk. Um, as part of that, if you look at that existing facade, there's basically two areas of glass at those entrance locations. One of the big concerns we did hear about was visibility of people being able to see in there. Um, and so we're open to restricting people being able to do that. We understand, we listen to the concerns of the planning board, whether that is keeping windows at a certain height tinting them at a lower height, providing shades. We can do obscure glass up to a certain height. There's a lot of flexibility that, that we'd be open to there to kind of limit visibility if that's a concern at all. If we were allowed all full glazing per architectural review, we'd be great with that too, but we don't require it. Um, 
And so at that point, if you take a look at that facade, you really can't look into, you wouldn't really know it's a winery, except for this possible signage. The signage up there is gonna be fairly minimally stated. Uh, you wouldn't be able to really see in there. Uh, this building also is gonna be, um, and we also added some high skylights or lights up in there that'll be kind of shined down in there into that space. The other thing, uh, the hours of operation, what we were concerned about again is that if you take a look out, um, you exit out the main entrance of the building, um, I've got a middle schooler and one that's went through high school and went through, went through the school and another one on the way. Um, so we're out there picking up the kids quite a bit. If you take a look at the traffic pattern, most of the kids kind of head out straight to the west or to the south there. Uh, not as many do move to the north. Um, and so this is a facility that if, and by three, they get out at 3.30, by 3.45, it's pretty quiet out there. Um, so we thought that it'd be appropriate to move the hours of operation during school days to four o'clock. That'd limit the kind of exposure of kids kind of walking by on there. We don't have any issue with that at all. Summer months, weekends, those type of things where the school isn't around open, we'd, you know, we'd open up at, at more, at earlier hours. Um, and so that's another way we're kind of trying to limit the exposure there. Any, you know, unless you're 21, you aren't getting in there without supervised adult. Um, which kind of again brings me back to the, the point that uh, you saw on your sheet, kind of this red diagram with a diameter around there of 600 feet, or I mean um, radius of 600 feet. From that main entrance, I uh, highlighted in red are all the different facilities in the area that serve or sell beer, wine, or alcohol in the space, including I think beer and wine served at the school itself uh, during TPH hour, you know, theater productions at night. So, we, and you know, you take a look at it and Jersey Boys, hey, my kid goes over and then grabs a slice of beach quite a bit. There's beer and wine in the counter there. And I guess what our argument there is that, look, we aren't introducing anything new. Um, we've received no public comment really an outcry saying, guys, come on, this is a bad place for this or anything else like that. And I think that's where the largest concern was from planning board. We're certainly gonna work with you guys um, if there's any sort of conditions to help minimize that aspect of this as possible, but we felt we've kind of addressed those concerns. We just want to be realistic that, you know, Spotted Bear is up in the corner. This isn't directly across from the middle school entrance. It's up a little bit. I know it's a split in hairs a little bit like that, but it's pretty reasonable use, kind of what they've got going on there. Um, and then the production side of it, of uh, you know, these are the type of businesses we're able to produce stuff and then send stuff off, off site. Uh, she's only manufacturing and, and having a tasting room for the stuff she produces on site, on the wine on site. She's not bringing in another alcohol or beer or anything else like that. So it's just a tasting room for what she's able to do there in private parties in that way. Um, and again, we kind of reviewed and came to the same conclusion that, that uh, Bailey had done with the state codes and the statutes of what's allowed here and what's not. So any further design or technical questions I'd be able to answer at this point. Thanks, Aaron. Any questions for Aaron? Not seeing any. Okay, thanks. thanks. Hi there, Nicole Erickson, uh, 75 Colorado Drive. Um, I just really want to start by reiterating that this is not a bar. Um, I have intentionally set hours of operation and will create an atmosphere to prohibit that stereotypical behavior associated with the bar. Um, I want this to be a place for the education and enjoyment of wine while also creating a unique environment for small gatherings. I listened to the concerns of the previous meeting and have adjusted the hours of business to operate outside of school hours. And as Aaron presented, the outside facade will be minimal and will not draw the attention of children that may pass by. Um, along with that, no one under the age of 21 will be allowed without the supervision of an adult. Um, prediction, or I'm sorry, production will be in the back half of the building, um, which will help isolate any aromas to the alleyway. Um, no pungent ingredients are used, you know, such as hops and barley that, you know, you might associate with a brewery. Uh, it's simply grape juice and yeast. Um, when the yeast is first added and the initial fermentation begins, that's when the aromas will be most noticeable. Um, however, no venting is required for a small production facility like I will be. There's no toxic fumes produced and the aroma is minimal enough that it is not necessary to clear out. Um, and I just, you know, really believe having a winery is both an attraction and asset to downtown Whitefish. And I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. Any questions for Nicole? Not seeing any now. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the presentation.
Any public testimony this evening on this item? Any public comment? We'll go ahead and close the public hearing and turn it back to the council for hopefully a motion. Ryan. I would move to approve WCUP 18-14, the findings of fact in the staff report, and the 10 conditions of approval as recommended by the Whitefish Planning staff on December 13th, 2018. Thanks, Ryan. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor <coughs> Melissa. Discussion? Richard. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, when it came up on the agenda, I have to say I watched your facial expression like, it's my turn. Uh, so thank you for being patient and waiting on us. Um, as uh, I just want uh, my fellow counselors, you'll notice that I voted against this uh, originally when it came before planning board. And I did that for one reason, and that was to give the school district a plenty of opportunity to weigh in ahead of tonight's um, here, public hearing. And I've heard <coughs> nothing uh, from the school district. And so uh, I'm going to vote for uh, this motion uh, because I think it, it'll be great. Uh, one of the concerns was that, <coughs> uh, and, and it's been addressed by the uh, Department of Revenue. Um, thank you very much for that, Bailey. Uh, the middle school is addressed on 2nd Street, even though there's no entrance anymore on 2nd Street, when we know that the entrance really is on uh, Spokane. Uh, that said, uh, I hope that when we get to um, the final design of the facade, uh, that really what will help drive that is the downtown master plan. Um, I think those were some concerns, how to get around if there was a problem with Department of Revenue and so on. So uh, hopefully uh, it'll be a very attractive uh, and open uh, facility. Um, so that people, when they go across the street to uh, watch the opera, uh, maybe before or after, they can uh, have a glass. Thanks, Richard. Further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign. And that motion carries unanimously. Best of luck. Yeah. We'll move on to item 6E of our agenda, which will be ordinance 19-5, adding a new section 2, public parks and grounds of title 7 of the Whitefish City Code to ban the erection of structures in city parks and public grounds. And this will be on a first reading. Angie. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. Um, my staff report begins on page 327 of the packet. And just a very brief background, um, public parks and grounds are considered um, public fora for purposes of First Amendment analysis. And basically what that means is the government's ability to limit expressive activity in those areas is very, very limited. Um, government may not engage in viewpoint discrimination, um, which is allowing certain groups to engage in expressive activity but forbidding other groups from doing the same thing based upon the message that they wish to portray. Um, in recent years, several cities has, have actually kind of got themselves in some hot water over unattended displays in public parks. And basically, the circumstances that led to those lawsuits were cities allowing certain displays, such as Christmas trees, but not allowing other displays, such as crosses. And additionally, many cities, I think including ours, have experienced an increase in people erecting structures um, in parks such as tents, um, camps, shelters, um, and so forth. Uh, as a result, uh, cities with increasing um, frequency have passed ordinances basically that ban unattended displays in parks and they um, prohibit the erection of other structures such as tents, camps, and such. And this isn't, uh, this isn't only to prevent cities from being accused of viewpoint discrimination or being put in the situation of having to prove um, a unattended display that might not be um, what we would want in our city parks, but it's also to improve aesthetics, um, safety. There was one city that I think during a holiday season had something like 40 unattended displays and there was really no 
way that people could even use the park. So those are the reasons that they've done. They, um, most of them, if they're well-crafted and they ban all, have been upheld as constitutional by the courts. So the proposed ordinance um, forbids groups and individuals from erecting tents, lodges, shelters, or any other structures on park property or public grounds. It also bans unintended displays in public parks and public grounds. Um, contains two exceptions. One is for um, installations that are the city's itself, so we would still be able to have our really pretty Christmas lights on our big trees in Depot Park. And the other exception is when the city issues a special event permit. And this doesn't mean that somebody can come in and ask for event permit for an unattended display. It just basically means if we're issuing a special event um, permit for an actual event, then in certain circumstances there can be a um, structure or unattended display. Um, the pro proposed ordinance was presented to the uh, Board of Park Commissioners at its meeting, and they did recommend that the City Council approve it. And there's no financial requirements or impacts of passing the proposed ordinance, and staff does represent, <coughs> sorry, recommend approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Ange. Any questions for Angela? We did advertise for a public hearing on item 6C of the agenda, which will be our own ordinance 19-5, and we'll hold that public hearing now. Anyone wishing to provide comment? Not seeing any, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing and turn it back to the council. Frank. <clears throat> Myself off here. Um, I would move to approve ordinance number 19-05, an ordinance to the city of Whitefish adding a new section two, public parks, uh, public parks and grounds of Title Seven of the Whitefish City Code, to ban the erection of structures in the city park and public park grounds. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Ryan. Further discussion. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that's unanimous. Michelle, thanks, Angie. Item seven A, consideration to authorize. Craig to proceed with the bidding of the city beach parking improvement project. Craig. Okay, good evening. Uh, this is actually a joint report uh, from the parks and rec department as well as the public works department. So I have to credit Maria with, with helping to draft this report. I just get the luxury of presenting it to you guys. Um, as I'm sure you're all well aware, the city does have a historical issue with parking congestion surrounding the city beach. Um, so in an effort to increase parking uh, for City Beach patrons, the city purchased the lot at 55 Woodland back in 2015. We subsequently advertised for proposals um, for consulting firms to complete the design of a parking lot improvement project in 2016. Uh, RFPs were reviewed and a committee was convened to conduct interviews of the highest ranking firms. I believe we had four firms that responded uh, and we interviewed three of them. Uh, upon completion of the interviews, it was the unanimous recommendation of the interview committee that a contract for professional services be awarded to TDNH and Bruce Booty for the project. Uh, as part of the design process, TDNH and Bruce Booty presented three different concepts for the lot at 55 Woodland Place. Uh, and at this time, it became quite clear that the number of parking places would be that we'd actually get out of the lot would be extremely limited due to the setback requirements that we have for parking lots. Um, nonetheless, all three concepts were presented to city staff, and this included both Chuck Stearns and Adam Hammett. This project does go back a few years. Um, one of the concepts provided significantly more parking by using Woodland Place, uh, by using the Woodland Place lot to create perpendicular on-street parking, as opposed to using the parking lot for an actual part, the using using the lot for an actual parking lot. Um, by incorporating this design. Um, will essentially be converting a portion of the lot into road right-of-way, which eliminates the need to observe these parking setbacks and gains us a, an additional 17 parking places. Um, after city staff reviewed all three options, it was agreed that the plan that provided the most amount of parking was preferable. This is option number C, which was presented to the park board uh, last October and was unanimously approved by the park board. Uh, in order to efficiently bid the project, we've broken it into three different schedules. Um, schedule one involves the reconstruction of Woodland Place uh, between Oregon Avenue and the alley, 
It also improves landscape improvements on the vacant lot that was purchased, uh, producing 18 parking spaces. Uh, this includes the pavement, the curb and gutter, the sidewalk, the retaining wall, the landscaping, uh, as well as a section of drought tolerant lawn, which will serve as a non-motorized watercraft staging area. Um, this schedule is estimated at approximately $123,000. Schedule two uh, involves the reconstruction of Woodland Place between the Alley and Washington Avenue. Uh, this produces six new parking spaces. Uh, and is estimated at about $90,000. And Schedule 3 involves the extension of the shared use path along Oregon Avenue, uh, which will serve as a connection from the Sky Park Bridge to City Beach. This is estimated at $22,000. Uh, assuming staff is authorized to proceed with the bidding, uh, we expect construction to begin um, the first week of April, obviously weather depending. Uh, and our goal is for substantial completion by Memorial Day weekend, which is the 24th of May. Uh, the current preliminary construction cost estimate for all three phases or all three schedules uh, is $235,705. This is about $25,000 over uh, the fiscal year 19 budget of $210,000, um, which is budgeted in the TIF budget. Um, however, I will say that we are uh, combining the bid of this project with uh, some improvements that we're planning at the City Beach lift station uh, in the hopes that we'll get some efficiencies from the bidders moving materials back and forth. Uh, based on the outcome of the bid, staff will evaluate the actual construction costs and make a final recommendation to council on which schedules to award, if any. Obviously trying to keep the project within the budget of $210,000. Uh, Mitigating parking congestion at City Beach is one of the council goals for fiscal New year 19 and staff believes this design meets the objectives of the city and represents an effective use of TIF funds and we therefore respectfully request authorization to proceed with the bidding of the project as presented. Thanks Craig. Any questions for Craig on his staff report? Richard. <clears throat> Does this mean you now can save those two really nice little sweet pear trees? No. Sorry. Okay. Pear trees go. <laughs> Further questions, or can I have a motion, please? Melissa. I move to approve authorization to proceed with the bidding of the City Beach Parking Improvement Project as presented in this report. Thanks. So Is there a second to the motion? <laughs> second. Seconded by Councillor Hildner. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously. Thanks, Greg. Dana, we're, we're to you. Okay. Resolution 19-1, item 8A of our agenda, a resolution of the City of Whitefish relating to financing of certain proposed projects establishing compliance with reimbursement bond regulations under the Internal Revenue Code. Great. Thank you. Good evening, um, Mayor and City Council. So as you know, we've been incurring costs, design costs, um, and engineering costs for our wastewater treatment plant upgrade project that we are looking forward to. Um, recently, you did approve a contract to purchase equipment for the facility and move forward with that contract. So we are anticipating to, to begin spending additional funds on the project outside of the preliminary design and engineering. While we do have always anticipated wastewater revenues to fund this project, um, we are still hopeful for that we would be awarded RGL and TSEP monies. Um, RGL looks more promising. We're ranked number three is what it would appear. TSEP, we're, we're a little bit behind, so that one's in question still. That being said, um, we are, due to the timing of collecting revenues for uh, wastewater service, we will be looking toward the SRF program, the State Revolving Fund, um, to issue a wastewater revenue bond um, we will ca cash fund a portion of the project, though. Um, as you can imagine, um, there are many federal tax-exempt bond regulations that will apply to this bond issue. Um, we have worked with our bond council, Dorsey and Whitney, out of Missoula, and they have helped to pre prepare this reimbursement resolution that helps us address one of those regulations um, where when you spend funds um, that will eventually be bonded uh, to have reimbursement of those costs, um, we have to have approval 
of the bond, approval of that to occur for it to keep its tax exempt status. Um, so we worked with uh, the city's engineering firm, Bond Council. Um, we came up with an estimated total cost. Obviously that cost will be uh, fine tuned as design continues now that we have the equipment selected. Um, but this resolution is necessary for us to move forward with the project. So there are no financial requirements at this time, um, but we respectfully recommend the city council approve the reimbursement re resolution as proposed in the packet. Thanks, Dana. Any questions for Dana? Motion. I'll move to approve resolution, resolution 19-01, a resolution of the City of Whitefish relating to financing of certain proposed projects establishing compliance with reimbursement bond regulations under the Internal Revenue Code as found on page 343 of our packet. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hartman. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously. Thanks, Dana. You have Adam's report and close with the packet. Any questions for our city manager? Adam, anything additional to report on? Nothing at this time, Mayor. Thank you very much. We'll move on quickly then to item 10, which is communications from the mayor and city councilors. We do have a letter enclosed in the packet from Aaron Wallace, who addressed us earlier this evening, requesting the council reconsider condition number 10 and 11 on WCUP 18-10 from our pre last meeting, the project located at 334 Central Avenue. I apologize that you had to stay so late, but it's just the order of business and where we could fit it on the agenda. Yeah. For this to be discussed, we would need to have a motion for reconsideration of, I believe, the original motion as well as the individual amendments if i'm not mistaken and that motion needs to come from a councillor who was present and it voted um with the majority richard if i'm not mistaken um i think well if it is the decision of a member of council uh it'll have to be each uh of the conditions in order uh, it's a two-step process for each one of those so that it would have to be a motion to reconsider and then a motion to reconsider the action just as we did earlier. Correct. Uh, and that would be the same for uh, condition 11 and then it would have to come back for a reconsideration of the main motion. So an, it's, it's a six-part project. <laughs> if if um, anyone w wishes to um, bring it up, and if anybody, anyone does, um, the first condition uh, could only be um, requested for reconsideration uh, by Councillor Hildner, Sweeney, or uh, Hennen. Correct. And that's for condition number 10. That's for condition number 10. I would move to reconsider condition number 10. That does require a second and then a roll call. There's second to Ryan's request. I'll second Ryan's request. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please. Oh. Excuse oh. me. <laughs> discussion? Oh, uh, on the reconsideration, uh, none on the reconsideration. Excuse me? I, none on the reconsideration of the condition, but there will have to be a second motion to reconsider the substance of the condition. Correct, but first okay. we need to have a roll call on the Ryan's motion. I'm not exactly clear. We're, we're diving deep into Robert's rules of order, but we'll figure okay. it out. <laughs> um, so I don't know if this comment is appropriate right now, but you can cut me off if not. Let, let's I'd vote on the okay. motion okay. first. Okay. Um, okay. Motion for reconsideration. Not can have any discussion. Is okay. there is, <laughs> those in favor of the motion? Please raise your hand. Those opposed, like those in favor, can, please. Uh, hold, can I vote? Is, is it only people that can participate in the reconsideration who voted in favor of the no. condition? No, you can. A everyone. Okay. Yep. Okay. 
Good question. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that passes on a four to one vote with Richard voting in opposition. And now we will need to have a motion to consider the amendment. Yeah, it'll have to be uh, pulled from the table because essentially that's what it was. Okay. I don't know how formal you want to be about that, but. Is that clear with everyone? Now we need a second motion. If so desired. If desired. And if not, we move on. The second motion being to. Whether or not to now reconsider the action that was okay. taken okay. on okay. condition number 10. Got it. In other <clears> words, <throat> do you want to revise it, do anything with it? If you don't want to do anything with it, it doesn't require a vote. I mean. It just goes away. And that still needs to come from Frank, okay. Richard, or Ryan. Then I would move yes. to reconsider condition 10 um, that stated the first floor shall be constructed lot line to lot line, north, south, east, west. I think that's right. Correct. Is there a second to that motion? So just to confirm, and I apologize, you are making a motion to put that? To lay that on the table, table for, for additional, for discussion purposes. Could, and then could you vote. restate your motion, please? I would move to reconsider condition 10, which states the first floor shall be constructed lot line to lot line, north, south, east, west. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hartman. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those, those opposed, like sign. And that passes, did you vote? I did. I didn't see how you voted. Negative. So it passes on a three to two vote, if I'm not mistaken, with Councillor Hildner and Sweeney voting in opposition. Now discussion on condition 10 which was imposed to require lot line to lot line construction, north, south, east, west. We're, we're getting there. I, I realize and I hope everyone bears with as we, because I think it's important that we go through the process correctly um, so that um, uh, the decision uh, uh, can stand uh, uh, scrutiny. And um, so I'll leave it at that for a moment without any further, dis well, I will. Um, <clears throat> my, my original condition was that it be the first floor be retail. Uh, that's what is set up, that is what is called we're, we're, for. We're speaking now to lot line to lot line. Oh, sorry, lot line to yeah. lot line. I'm, Thank you. We all get confused here. <laughs> uh, lot line to lot line. Uh, and that is exactly what is called out uh, in the downtown master plan. Uh, that's what was discussed uh, even earlier today. That's um, if, if it were just a foot uh, because of fire, uh, that's one thing. Um, I think that uh, in order to take the long view, and this is the long view I had originally, uh, was that the 30-year view of what the downtown will look like or could look like or perhaps even should look like is that uh, we extend that same rhythm, that same concept, that same look that we have looking north as we look south from that intersection of third and central. And so my uh, condition number 10 of lot line to lot line uh, is my recommendation or my um, preference. My, my preference. <clears throat> Ryan, would you uh, like to, Melissa, oh, sorry. I was just going to chime in. Um, you know, m my concern is, one, just seeing the renderings um, of what it will look like prior to new construction coming in next door um, was uh, not so attractive, <laughs> my opinion. Um, and 
I question how long we would have to kind of live with that. Um, I also am taking into consideration the recommendation of the Architectural Review Board and do I feel like we're, we're sacrificing something significant from that future vision? I, I guess I just um, am interpreting it a little differently and um, again, in the interest of kind of uh, the aesthetics of, of the town, I, that's, so mm -hmm. that's why I'm in, in favor of, of, um, of not having lot line to lot line. And I agree with Melissa. Um, I think what I've read over the past two weeks, it looks like this will substantially res restrict what they're able to do with this building. And I just think that it, it's getting tougher and tougher for me to defend the more I think about it. Um, and if I could do it all over again, I, I would vote against the lot line to lot line requirement. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what Melissa said. I think I look at what the town looks like. I, I don't think this is a bad project. I don't think it's gonna, I, I really don't think it's gonna have that much of a detrimental impact on the downtown. I'll, if I may, sure. I'll say it again. I've tried to take that much longer view. I think that there are, um, based on my, what I heard at the Architectural Review Committee meeting, uh, and that uh, there was considerable discussion by that committee the letter itself from that committee reflects, if you read carefully, that there is not absolute unanimity amongst that committee uh, for uh, setbacks. Chief Page can correct me if I'm wrong, but windows could be permitted along the wall, uh, but they would be obviously very, very expensive because they would have to meet certain fire codes. Mm -hmm. um, but that does not preclude that element. I also spent some more time looking at that street corner, just standing there, staring at it. People kind of gave me weird looks maybe. But um, uh, I, I think that um, it does not have to be uh, a compromised uh, facade. It does not have to be uh, but that's certainly the work of the Architectural Review Committee. It's not our position to make that architectural decision, but ours is to say what is the plan uh, for the growth of our downtown core in the long, long term. If you're acknowledged by a council member, Yeah, go ahead, Bill. If you don't mind, just approach the podium, please, and just name an address for the record. Bill Goldberg, 1240 Birch Point Drive. So, Richard, one correction that I would point out, and Joe, I don't know if you know the technical side on the fire code for us. If we get within three feet of that property line, we are not allowed... Um, more than 15% uh, windows along that, that north and south line when you step it in five feet. So I'm not correcting the statement of you can add the glass, you just won't be able to add the glass as shown. So it'll be quite minimal if we're forced to the outside, to the property line. Once we step inside five feet from the property line, that number goes up to 25%, which we're under as shown, but we just went 
kind of as a middle ground. So. Great. Thanks, Bill. Yep. Technical question, is that first floor or all floors? I believe that's all floors, anything that's within that distance. Thanks. If there's going to be a desire to amend condition 10 or strike it from the record, we need to have that motion now, or I'm going to suggest that we move on to condition number 11 if the council would like to reconsider 11. I think you have to deal with 10 and then move on to 11. I'm trying to yeah. get us to deal with it. Then I would, I would move to strike condition 10. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councilor Hartman. Discussion? Andy. Um, I kind of hear what Richard's saying if we look at the long-term view, but in the short term, and I think if we do look at mitigating negative impacts of the building, we're not, neg we're not mitigating those negative impacts on either property to the north or the south. I mean, that I have to agree with that. Um, both those property owners would prefer to see some separation between those buildings. And if we look at that block on the east side, obviously we currently have that, and I think we'll probably have that for a long time given where the church is at and given the buildings that are built immediately to the south. So I think we're going to have a break. I don't see the Lutheran Church going anywhere anytime soon. I don't see it's going to still be there in 30 years. It's going to be there in 50 years. I guess it's there in 75 years, and there's going to be a break between it and the other building. The Presbyterians? Yeah, Presbyterian Church, excuse me, yeah. Presbyterian Church. Can't mix the Presbyterian Sorry, I was getting in touch with my Norwegian heritage there. So, I mean, I don't see that five feet is that huge a deal. Um, honoring the downtown master plan, though, it is something that we have stuck our guns, stuck with our guns pretty, pretty strongly to. And that's where I find myself struggling with this decision. What Andy said. <laughs> you need a little bit more time to think about it before we take a vote? All those in favor of the motion to strike condition number 10, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And the motion fails on a three to two vote with Councillor Hennan and Hartman voting in favor. We do have in the letter, obviously, the request to reconsider condition number 11, which required that the ground floor be entirely dedicated to 100% uh, retail use. Uh, that was voted on by Frank, uh, Richard, and Melissa, so we would have to <clears throat> have someone motion. Um, who voted for that in favor to reconsider uh, condition number 11, if you so desire. And there can't be discussion unless we have that motion. So, is there any interest? I'll make a motion. So, Please do. Um, so I make a motion to, is it to reconsider condition number 11? Yep. Um, that's to, it. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. Is there a second to the motion? Can I second that? Yes. I second. <laughs> <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Hennan. Further discussion on the motion to reconsider? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that motion carries with Richard and, did, how did you vote? Four. Four. The motion carries on a four to one vote with Richard voting in opposition. Now we'll need a second motion to reconsider the action taken on condition number 11. And that again has to be made by Frank, Richard, or Melissa. Um, OK, 
Okay, how do I? <laughs> Just a motion to reconsider okay. the action. And make a motion taken. to reconsider um, condition number 11 on conditional use permit WCUP 18 10. And the action taken. The action. On, on condition 11. Um, and the, the, the approval or the passing sure. of sure. Yes. that condition. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Hennon. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And that carries on a four to one vote with Richard uh, voting in opposition. Melissa, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, <laughs> uh, I guess I just felt like it maybe warranted some more discussion. Um, and, you know, on, on one hand, you know, I, I want to honor the, the master plan, but also on the other, kind of recognizing, um, you know, some of the realities and, uh, you know, what zoning permits, um, you know, what other similar um, establishments are, are doing in that area. So, I don't know, I just felt like it was worthy of more discussion and based on the letters that came in, so. Dave, Anybody? I have a question. When we adopted the update to the downtown master plan, was it planning's <laughs> intention to apply the exception that we allow from Central Avenue between Third and Railway to then apply South to Fourth Street? I mean, <clears throat> the intention would have been to use the same language that we use on Central Avenue. Um, it's pretty unrealistic to require 100% of a ground floor to be retail. The back portions of a building are usable, um, typically for retail. Um, has, it, has it been our intent to bring that? Text yeah, that was something that was forward. part of the implementation. We were going to look at that. I mean, one of the the drawbacks was that, you know, when that was first adopted, there were still, you know, uh, Sean Frampton's office there. You had Tim Murphy's office there. When we adopted that other portion on Central Avenue, I mean, the council put an exemption in there for the law offices that existed so they'd be grandfathered in perpetuity. So there were some questions about, you know, how that would be adopted on that section since there was so much professional office between third and fourth. So, there, you know, we needed to get that clarified as we moved forward with that. But the intention would have been to apply that 70% of the ground floor um, and facing the, the retail frontage on Central for the retail. 70% retail facing central, 30% yeah. in the rear. Mm -hmm. I guess I would argue that if the intent is to continue with the rhythm of the architecture between third and fourth, wouldn't it be the intent to have the rhythm of the 70-30 continue south? I don't see what the difference would be in the application of allowing for mixed use on the ground floor, whether you're north of third or south of third, given that we're trying to maintain continuity along Central Avenue. I'll comment. Um, my ocular estimate of existing retail uh, downtown um, is generally front to back. Uh, it is somewhere in the 2,000 to 2,500 square foot range. Um, we denied fresh life um, on a similar argument um, that uh, conditional use permit um, because of the uh, lack of retail and I'm just trying to be consistent with not only the, down, the downtown master plan, but with what we uh, decided uh, with regards to uh, fresh life. And um, I think it's consistent. <clears throat> There's nothing to preclude commercial on the second floor. I realize that they would like to have mm -hmm. apartments, but there's nothing to, to prohibit commercial on the second floor. Mr. Mayor, is there, are, are, we've had a nice discussion. 
is there a mo if somebody wants to change what we did, that they have to propose or suggest either a striking of it altogether or a substitute to substituting what they want? That's correct. I would add one further entreaty, Mr. Mayor, that as we consider this thing, one of the things that puts me a little bit on the fence is that if we do not require, as the master plan suggests, that the first floor of these buildings uh, be retail, um, there will be no retail to be had. And so we'll have a self-fulfilling prophecy of not having the retail that we want if we don't require that those floors or substantial portions of them be retail, whether it pencils or not. Um, and I understand that's an issue. Everybody's entitled to make some money. I get that. Um, but it really is a function of if we do not require substantial portions or all of the first floors of new construction in that block or any other place in downtown, um, we will self-fulfill not having the retail space that we want downtown. Yeah, you go ahead. So just pointing out that if we're forced, if we're forced to the lot lines on the outside, I just want to make it clear that you guys understand that there's going to be 9,000 square feet of space. The 30%, if you cut that back and, and, and follow what the rest of downtown is, still puts 7,000 square feet approximately, 6,500 to 7,000 feet of retail. So I think that's a substantial amount of retail space. I mean, I'm obviously constructing the buildings across the street, and those are 18, 17, 1,800 square foot units going in each, I will tell you that we've had very limited people looking for that large of space. So you see the, the floor plan of what we constructed here. With the force of the outside, which you guys have already made your decision, it's going to limit us extremely, and I mean that extremely, to find somebody looking for that much retail space without those windows. So considering the fact of 7,000 square feet coming into play with approximately 2,000 to 2,500 square feet being put at the alley, because it cannot go towards central, that's clear in that, in, in that uh, restriction, that we put that office or commercial space in the alley would be a minimal amount in comparison to the total square footage. Be the only thing I'd point out. Melissa. Um, I'll make a motion to um, if I if I wanted to revise or say allow for that 70 30 percent split to continue on that block then just to, I think you just recommend an amended okay. condition number 11. Okay so I recommend amending condition 11 um, for conditional use permit WCUP 18-10 um, to allow for, is it the, um, a 70%, 30% split um, similar to the uh, other downtown blocks. Is that sufficient? Yep. And a 30% of the ground floor area not visible from Central Avenue nor located within the retail storefront area. So it ensures that it's pushed to the back of the building. Right, correct. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Fury. Discussion? Yeah, I'll speak to it really quickly. Um, I'll vote for this motion. Um, we're not for a conditional use permit. That's something that they could do by right. Um, the intent of the downtown master plan was to not create dead zones 
on the street. And by allowing 30% commercial non-retail in the back of that building, you're not going to create a dead zone on the street because you're still requiring that the front of that building is all retail, everything that fronts on Central Avenue. And that was the intent. It wasn't to create all of the square footage. It was to create a continuity to draw your pedestrians on down and past. That was the whole purpose of that. And that's why it was, we ended up with the zoning at the 70-30. Because we realized, like, hey, you know, it's like, yeah, if you got a bigger building, it's like, that's just going to be a pretty big retail spot. So, so yeah, I'll vote for this motion. And the alternative to that is, you know, we're talking about three city lots, and the applicant could easily come in with a new application, put in three 7,500 square foot buildings with postage stamp retail. Exactly. And, and have 30% commercial use in the by back right. of every one of them. Use by right. Non retail. Yeah. Use by right. Further discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And the motion does carry on a three to two vote with Councillor Hennon and Hildner voting in opposition. So the record will reflect the condition number 11 has been modified for the 70-30 split bill. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Until we get back to the original motion. Correct. Good point. <laughs> So now we do have to move on the original motion, which was to approve um, conditional use permit 18-10 um, as amended uh, this evening for condition number 11 only. I think you can take now your original motion now that you have um, condition 10 that is lot line, lot line, north, south, east, west, and you have condition 11 uh, which is 70% retail, 30% commercial, the 30% remaining in the back. Right, it's um, been articulated. And so that, those are your two conditions. And now we can go back to the original um, motion for reconsideration. Motion and as conditioned by um, the original condition 10 and the modified or amended condition 11. Okay. Is everyone clear that we're going to now vote on that original motion? Yes. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? All those in Richard. Yeah, I would. Uh, just because <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure I'm being uh, labeled as a negative uh, Nelly uh, or uh, as Spiro Agno said, a nattering nabob of negativity. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, I, I won't vote for it just because I thought that the original uh, was the appropriate uh, motion uh, that we passed uh, at the previous council meeting. Understood. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign. And the motion does carry on a three to two vote with Councillor Hennon and Hildner voting in opposition. Thank you for your help tonight with the rules of order. <laughs> We'll stay with communications from the mayor and city councilors. We'll start with Richard. Oh, gosh. Um, first, Dana, happy birthday. Um, and I'm sure that it'll go right across the dais uh, for that. Um, secondly, Craig, could, if not today, maybe in February, whatever works best for you, uh, given the hour that it's now 1030, uh, is our street ordinance on snow plowing, people moving their vehicles, is it working? Because I've had a couple of people um, come up to me and there's still some confusion, but others are saying it seems to be working. So um, could you either get back to us, maybe at the next council meeting, um, and just let us know what feedback the city's getting? Or maybe Adam would like to weigh in on this, or Chief Dial, uh, or Chief Page, and, and everybody get in on this uh, uh, comment. You know, Robert's rules of orders, can I even address this, or do I need a couple counselors to? <laughs> I, I, my uh, my own like. <laughs> personal um, opinion, and that I believe of the Public Works staff, is that it is working. Um, when it snows, we see a, a pretty marked improvement in people moving their vehicles to the correct side of the street. So 
given that we're on year one um, of this new ordinance, I'm really happy with the progress. Uh, and finally, um, I don't know how to do this to be timely, um, but we might think about a letter of support uh, for um, David Fern's uh, bill on affordable housing um, that would also include single as well as multifamily homes, a, a letter of support from uh, the Whitefish City Council. And I don't know exactly what form that would take, but maybe staff could help us with uh, producing that letter to... I'm not familiar with the, the bill. I'm so, not either, but, um, but other than what I just heard, and, and, and uh, I don't know how best to, to get after that. Um, and I don't know when it might be considered. Dave, is this something you could take a crack out and just shoot it over to us for... Yeah, we'll try to find the text yeah. of that so we can take a look through it and read through it so we understand what it's actually saying. And yeah, one page of comments. I mean, it doesn't need yep. to be a... Yeah, and, and it may not book. be something we want to support, but I, yeah. I think it's worth us taking it. a look yeah. at. That's all. Thanks. Andy? Uh, I didn't see anything in the minutes, and I just... Question for Craig. Where are we at on tin and plastic? I see their bins are still out there. We were supposed to be done the first of the year, but obviously we're still collecting it, and I get a lot of people asking, what's going on with tin and plastic? Yeah, we our contract with North Valley Rep... Well, now Republic... Um, goes through, I believe, September of this year. I think it was a three-year. I'm going to have to double-check on, on what the terms of the contract are, but as of right now, uh, we're told by North Valley Refuse that they still have an active contract uh, with waste management out of Spokane to collect the commingled um, recyclable waste, so tin, uh, one and two plastic, and aluminum. Um, and then obviously there's the cardboard bins and the mixed paper bins out there. And so um, North Valley has been abiding by that contract. They haven't hit us up with any um, negotiations to change the contract. I believe their um, contract with waste management goes at least through this year. So it's still available. I will chat with them based on um, the comment we heard earlier about frequency of, of collecting. Um, that bin. It should also be noted that those bins are only for the use of City of Whitefish businesses and residents. So um, we do get a lot of questions from people outside city limits um, about the use of those bins, but they're really just for um, city taxpayers. So still use them. All right. I'll tell everybody they can still do it. Happy birthday, Dana. <laughs> Ryan, thanks. Happy birthday, Andy. Dana. Uh, I would just remind everyone that ski joring is this weekend. Oh, yeah. Frank. Yeah, I'll go back to my earlier harp. Um, I know we don't have a tree protection ordinance. Um, Wendy and I had a long talk about that today. and We've apparently discussed it many times. I would like, or it would seem to me that given our historic and even recent experiences, that we might ought to reconsider bringing some kind of a tree protection ordinance. And it would apply in situations where we have developers who in fact promise and obligate themselves to protect um, trees um, on the properties they wish to develop and allow us to provide uh, further incentive for them to do just that by providing penalties associated with their failure to do so. Um, I think that would be appropriate. It would add additional teeth to um, our commitment to um, the promises as conditions that we are willing to approve for certain developments on. Um, and so I, I, I would like us to look at that, and I think it would be, um, I think it's timely. Um, I'm not suggesting that we prevent people from, you know, cutting down private trees. That's fine. I, I get it. I may disagree with it. But this would be, at least in my view, applied in areas where we have um, developers in particular um, uh, wanting to us to approve certain things, and then we condition it on the protection of certain trees or certain barriers, and then they for whatever reason, um, manage to damage them and they get eliminated. 
Um, so I would, I would like us to have, take a look at that and see what we could put in place um, if anybody else is interested. Is there an interest among the council? Yeah, I would. Okay. I'm interested. Frank, you're talking about just areas where you guys have discretionary approval, a conditional use permit, a PUD. I mean, that's something you guys could add as a condition on all told, those types of things. I was told that I could not add further conditions and, for example, creating what I'll call a fine or penalty um, in addition to requiring a two-inch caliper tree replace a... 50, 60, 70 year old tree. Um, and so I'd like us to, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm misled, then I would like to, I'll move at some point to reconsider uh, the motions I made earlier um, to add that condition or add that kind of a uh, provision in there. But if I can't have that, um, I still think we should, should consider this. I mean, you can add a condition that they replace the trees. Now, if you're trying to create a penalty, that's yes. something that's going to have to apply equally to all private property owners, <coughs> not just that developers. Dedicate, so. That dedicate those trees to, as a condition of our approving their development. Does that make sense? It I'm does. Not saying, I mean, I guess I'm it, not saying you can't cut down a tree in your front yard. You own it. I may disagree with you, but you get to do that. This is a different deal. I'm talking about issues where... People who want to develop their property make promises to this community about preserving um, and buffering that development and then, for whatever reason, fail to do so. And then we're left with a two-inch caliper tree. I think people get more encouraged to do the right thing if there's a certain incentive or penalty for failure to do that. And that's what I'm going after. Is that something we can look at, David? Yeah, we can look at it. I'll have to, you know, Angie and I'll have to go over how that would be applied. I'm, not I'm sure. all ears. Great. I, I just don't see how <clears throat> you can apply an ordinance to specific subsets of the community. I think if you pass an ordinance, it needs to apply to everyone. I, th I think I agree with Dave that if you want to impose that upon a particular developer at the time the development comes forward, you can certainly do so with a condition, which is probably a much better approach than making a citywide ordinance that somehow we have to enforce only on certain groups. Okay. Well, then but, I would like that confirmed by Angie. Okay. That's fine. And if that's the case, um, I want that confirmed between now and the next meeting because I will move to reconsider what I, what I suggested earlier, to add those kinds of provisions. So tell me what I can do. Okay, Frank, and I'm just trying to understand what you're trying to do. I mean, I, I completely understand when <clears throat> uh, approval is conditioned on you not touching certain trees and then they cut down the trees, what do we do? You know, I mean, we or can- Or they be, drive on them, or they hit yeah, them, or they, exactly. oops, I spilled something. Or I mean, te oops, technically yeah. our enforcement mechanisms, we can revoke the permit, but it sounds to me like you're looking for the likelihood of us doing that is oh yeah I know it's very very low let me let me take a look at it and see what other cities have done good thank you yep thanks Frank Melissa nothing to add but happy birthday <clears throat> Dana <laughs> I had nothing further to add either anything additional from staff Adam I just wanted to mention that uh, I am reviewing other Senate bills and House bills and I've got staff reviewing some of them and the league of uh, Montana cities and towns are reviewing a few and then I'll have a report to, to send out to the to the council on the ones that we want to support and whatnot. I know there was one that came up that was being heard early that I didn't like and Dave Fern was able to kill it. So, <laughs> And that was a bill essentially requiring cities that if you want to pass uh, an emergency ordinance or, or declaration of emergency that you can only do so if there is imminent peril. Of course, by the time we ever come in here to dis if we're if we're here meeting and there's imminent peril out there, I, I think we have other issues. So anyway, it, it was a really bad bill, and I and at first Dave thought it was going to be tough to to kill, but I think we got it killed. So hooray! <laughs> you know the hard part is too. I mean, when we get into large scale events, we need state and federal agencies to come help 
to help us. And FEMA will not come to your community unless you've declared a state of disaster, period. State of emergency has to be declared, they don't come. And then also that bill said that it, would, it, it has to go to judicial review at the request of anyone. So I don't know, it was, it was pretty ridiculous, but it was one that kind of caught my eye that we were able to, to get shot down. But there are others that we may want to support or shoot down as well, but I'll, I'll have a report for you coming up. Great, Thanks. I think I think today was the last day for general bills. I think revenue bills can continue till the end of the week, or, but I'll let you guys know. Great, thanks. On that note, we are adjourned. Thanks, everyone.